Good morning all and welcome to the third annual of the Global Alliance for Climate Smart Agriculture. And it's very, uh, we're very delighted to see you come in great numbers and uh, from all regions of the world. Uh, there are many people still waiting at the security, but we will start uh, given that we have our speakers here and we have quite a tight program. And uh, we know that unfortunately some people have been delayed due to some weather um, changes or extreme events. So, uh, but we are very glad uh, to see you here this morning with us. I am Mi Nguyen, um, Deputy Permanent Representative of Canada here to the FAO and also one of the two co-chairs of the Alliance since June 2016, when the last annual forum took place here at FAO uh, headquarters. Good morning to everyone. It's good to be together once more for the third time in terms of the annual forum. My name is Martin Wadia. I'm coming from the Nepad Agency as the head of program, and, uh, program development and strategy and also co-chair for the Global Alliance since actually the, the formal start in, in 2014. So as I said, uh, good to be together once more and thank you very much. Looking forward to very active and productive three days. Thank you. So we have a very rich program ahead of us over the next three days, which we are very excited about. And we want it to be concrete and forward-looking, and we hope that we will be able to share experiences and set up strategic goals for the future of the Alliance with a view to revitalizing efforts to scale up climate smart agriculture in various ecosystems and regions of the world and we want to take into account lessons learned uh, over the past three years since the inception of the Alliance. We will give particular attention to results achieved by the Alliance, its three action uh, groups and its members, as well as increased regional engagement. But before we do that and dive into our discussions, we would like to give the floor and invite FAO to open this annual forum. As many of you know, FAO's continued engagement with the Alliance has been critical in many ways. As pioneer in the new narrative that the Climate Smart Agriculture approach introduced and also in housing the facilitation unit of the Alliance. And in effort to capture the breadth of such engagement, we will have three FAO speakers to give opening remarks within the next 20 minutes. So that will be a challenge, especially since we already started a bit with a delay, but very important. So we will start with Ms. Mariana Mari, Maria Elena Semedo, Deputy Director General Natural Resources, who has accompanied us in this journey since the beginning, followed by Mr. René Castro, the Assistant De Deputy General for Climate, Biodiversity, Land and Water Department, which houses the facilitation unit. And ending with Mr. Clayton Campanola, leader of the strategic program two of FAO, which is called Making Agriculture, Forestry, and Fisheries More Productive and Sustainable. Without further ado, Ms. Simido, I would like to give you the floor. Thank you. Good morning. Now I realize that we have three from FAO in the panel, and I, I hope we are not, we have, we could be successful not repeating each other, which is not easy. But uh, let me start by welcoming you all to FAO to attend the third annual forum of the Global Alliance for Climate Smart Agriculture. It's always a pleasure for me to, to be with the friends of the, the Global Alliance. As uh, me said, I have been in this hold since the beginning. I think I can see the progress made. And uh, what I would like to start saying that this meeting is taking place in a very important day. As you know, we are celebrating today the second anniversary of the Paris Agreement. And you all recall the important moment two years ago when all the, the community, all the leaders, they agree, they reach an agreement on reaching the how action we need to do to keep the two degrees or, if possible, 
1.5 degree. It was, I think, a very important moment for the world. On top of that, it was one of the agreement to be signed and ratified with a high speed. And now the challenge we have today, and I think uh, the summit today aims to take further action on climate finance, how we can mobilize additional resources to implement the agreement, but also to accelerate climate action. Because it's good to have an agreement, but we need to move towards implementation. And to implement, we need action for all the stakeholders, the countries, the intergovernment organization, the non-government uh, actors, civil society, private sector, and also we are here around this table, all actors, to see how GAXA can contribute to implement and also to increase ambition and to speed action towards the implementation of the, the Paris Agreement. Uh, also, we have a very important moment, not only the celebration of the second anniversary, but we just concluded the COP23, and I believe it was a very important COP for agriculture and food security. Uh, it was the first COP to be organized by a small island development states. I think the small island development states, which are very much vulnerable to climate change, they could be seen or be in the front of action. But we have several decisions very important to agriculture and food security. And I think I would mention the Coronivia joint work on agriculture, agriculture which covers promising areas where all of us are active soils, livestock, nutrients and water management, assessment of adaptation, socioeconomic and food security. And I believe this gives us a clear map towards 2020 where the, the, agreement, the Paris Agreement will start its uh, implementation. Another important decision in COP23, which is very much in link what GAXA has been doing, is the Gender Action Plan and the Local Communities and Indigenous Platform. Uh, I believe every time we speak, gender is on, the, uh, on GAXA. We refer the importance of women, how we can help them to adapt to the effects of climate change. They are the most affected. And this Gender Action Plan gives us a platform which can be useful to, to GAXA. On the same time, FAO has been very active in the area of climate change this year. Uh, we adopted a new strategy on climate change. It was a strategy uh, adopted by FAO conference in uh, July this year, and it has been a very uh, a, a strategy discussed towards all level of FAO uh, at, at the decentralized office, uh, the technical committees, and I believe we have a very uh, a strategy where climate change and we have clear action plan for FAO and climate smart agriculture approaches are high on our uh, climate strategy uh, and FAO ac actions in climate will be linked to the action in this uh, strategy. Also we approve in during our conference what we call a biennial team is a team to be discussed in the next two years uh, in the regional conference, in the technical committees, and is, is also linked to climate change. Uh, it's, I am looking at the, the team. Climate change and its impact on FAO work and activities. We have to report on all our governing bodies what we are doing at country level, at regional level, and the global level. This shows you how FAO has been focused 
our work and climate change is coming very high on our, on our work. On top of that, one year ago, we established a new department, a department on climate, biodiversity, land and water. We have the new ADG at the end of uh, my, my left, and he is in charge of implementing the strategy uh, to collaborate with all the stakeholders. He will be in charge of GAXA, and he, he, the, the, um, the alliance will, uh, will be hosted by the, the department. You can see that FAO, we have been very active. I believe we had a very, also very active participation in Bonn this year. And I, I could say the same to uh, the Global Alliance. The Global Alliance attended uh, COP23, uh, was part of the Agriculture Action Day. Uh, we launched the Climate Smart Agriculture source book, and also new knowledge products were developed. Uh, the Alliance has broadened its activities at regional level, expanding its scope of activities and also broaden the partnership in Asia, Asia and Africa. I think we have more uh, regional alliance, we have several activities developed in Asia and in Africa. And it will be submitted to your endorsement today, the strategic vision. The strategic vision in my view is very important. It gives GAXA a new vision for 2018 and beyond. Uh, but more than that, what is important is to link this global vision to an action plan. We need a work plan to implement this vision. In 2014, when the Alliance was launched in New York, we had a, a vision, I think is good, two, two years later, to revisit the vision and to see how the world has changed, how the climate environment has changed, and what we consider GAXA could be more relevant, how we can be more focused, and how we can be more action-oriented in the ground, which is our aim. You remember when GAXA was established, the objective was 500 million farmers will utilize climate smart agriculture approaches in, their, uh, in adapting to, to climate change. Uh, as I said, we need a, a work plan, a concrete work plan. We need to approve the vision which gives us the action. And I believe the theme of this annual forum, climate smart in action across scales, give us the, the possibility to revisit all the instruments we have. And also maybe just for your thinking, uh, should we also revisit the governance of the Alliance or not? Are we happy with the Alliance the way it's functioning? It's just a question because if you need a strategic vision, we have a, a work plan and we need to implement the work plan. All the instruments we have in place, are they facilitating the implementation or not? But I leave it to your thinking and your endorsement. Another important point in my view is the membership. We have expanded, expanded the membership, but so far we are not increasing as we have expected the number of countries joining the Alliance. We need to have a more balanced membership. This is also very important uh, to the Alliance. Uh, uh, again, uh, an important figure is the financial. In Paris, they are mobilizing additional resources for the agreement, and I think here we have also mobilize additional resources for the Alliance. We, at the beginning, we are able to have resources which were enough for the Alliance uh, to function, but now 
I believe if you need to move forward, if you want to have a relevant alliance, we need to mobilize additional partners and additional resources in order to assure that GAXA is sustainable. As I said, and I, don't, I think you don't doubt, you don't have any doubt, FAO stands ready to continue supporting the alliance as we have been doing since the beginning, giving you technical support, giving financial contribution even in kind if when required and possible, and also to support you in whatever you consider important for the Alliance and what FAO can contribute. Before I concluding my remarks, I would like to take this opportunity to thank one of the founders of the Alliance, who is leaving us beginning of 2018 for a deserved retirement, Mark Maines. Mark Maines is the senior policy advisor the United States Department of Agriculture. He has been of great support of the Alliance since its establishment with very uh, deep analysis, in-depth contributions to the functioning of the Alliance and always very positive, even in the difficult moments when all of us were very negative towards the Alliance. And I think this forum, it shows that you are right, Mark, that we have moved forward, we have a lot to do, but this is a very important milestone in the life of the Alliance. I wish you all the best in your new life, but I know you have the Alliance in your heart. We'll be continuing to contribute to the Alliance. Thank you for all our, your contribution. I think he deserves... <laughs> With this, I would like again to thank you for your participation. And I wish you a fruitful deliberation and FAO stands ready to accompany you in the implementation of your deliberations. Thank you. And congratulations also to the co-chairs, to the work they have achieved throughout this time. I know it's not easy. They are co-chairs of the Alliance on top of other additional responsibilities they have. But they have been successful managing the Alliance. Congratulations and all the best also in this new meeting today. Thank you again to all of you. Thank you very much, Ms. Semedo, for your continued support and personal commitment to the Alliance. And as well for outlining again that we've come a long way since uh, we were launched in 2014 and that there are important milestones in the global policy agenda in which we operate and which we aspire to contribute to. And as well to ask real questions that we will uh, need to think about and reflect over the next three days and hopefully come up with answers with, uh, by the closure of our three days. I would like now to turn uh, to Mr. Castro and uh, give him the floor for opening remarks. Uh, you're welcome to stay here or to take the podium. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Madam Semedo, for passing me the, bat the, the baton with this, uh, you know, high uh, hopes and, and remarks. And thank you all for your effort. Let me briefly only add to what Madam Semedo, you know, already described. We started in 2014, 200 or a little bit more entities already in the alliance, 32 countries include Climate Smart as part of their NDCs, the National Determined Contributions of the Paris Agreement. And Two things happen at the same time. One, the world continue making uh, agreements and setting goals from parties in climate. 
to the broader sustainable development goals. So you, you can be proud that you have influenced the, the way of thinking and planning uh, in the last three years. But there is a say that when you, are, when you are, have a success, you either adapt to the new stage or, you know, you will be recognized and thank you for your contribution and that's it. I see a, a very interesting path for moving forward. Let me briefly mention three. One, of course, is we have different instruments now. For example, starting in 2018, the countries will be reviewing the national determined contributions for the Paris Agreement that now is uh, ratified. And just to mention some ideas that will be or, or need to be included, me remind us one of these days that you know gender gender should be a critical part of the new NDCs and indigenous people rights should be a critical part of the NDCs. And now we also know that there is a, the world is trying, and, and please notice the word I use, trying to have a different development path instead of, you know, continue and doing business as usual, as usual that will take us to five degrees Celsius in warming. The world is aiming trying to change that toward a 1.5 or 2. And we are not there yet. The Paris Agreement, the NDCs of the countries, all the efforts may, may conduct us to a 3 degrees scenario. Three degrees a scenario will be devastating in terms of economics and social and environmental issues, especially for developing countries, for small island developing states, and for the tropical part of the world that is hypersensitive to changes, especially in terms of biodiversity conservation. So we, we are going to start this review in January 2018. So we have a new vehicle, new instrument there for our countries to do the, the implementation. And, and then we have an agreement already, which is another target, 500 million farmers doing uh, and, and implementing climate smart agriculture. So it should be in your proposals as national determined contributions going to the, the finance institutions, going to the, the, the policy-making entities in your country, going to the other stakeholders. And then, uh, so I, I'm, I'm answering my, my own challenge at the beginning. Is there a room for the GAXA? You were precursors. Is there a room for the longer term? Well, we have agreed that agriculture is probably the only sector that has two very distinctive features that seems contradictory sometimes. One, it produces a lot of emissions when deforestation, when there is soil erosion, when there are forest fires, etc., etc. A lot of emissions. At the same time, is the, it has the unique characteristic that has the ability to fix or sequester a big a big chunk, a big part of those emissions. 
and to do it immediately and in a cheaper or to make it more elegant in a least cost way when compared with other alternatives like transportation and energy. In the next 10, 15 years, agriculture will be the most efficient alternative for climate mitigation and adaptation. Then other alternatives will kick in and will be more competitive. But in the next 10, 15 years, we have the responsibility to show to the world that yes, the, the, the investment we are all making in, ta in terms of resources, people, efforts, changes in policies, are producing results. That what, whatever we are doing will turn the world toward a more sustainable path and will give us hope that eventually we will reduce the global warming from five to three, as we did in Paris, and from three to hopefully you know, 1.5, as we aim in, in Paris. That is not happening without our action. And ju just to finish, we will be willing to work uh, at another point that we were discussing with some of you in these days. Some of the countries invited me to another very difficult exercise. What are the differences between climate smart agriculture and agroecology? Between agroecology and what we are doing in the globally important uh, heri agricultural heritage systems? Well, it took us a while to find some differences. There were many similarities and many uh, actions that seems to be converging and there is no room for for inefficiencies or for waste so we will need also to think you know how all these instruments we have and these approaches we have can can do better so to make a, a, a statement shorter this is the time for implementation but also is the time for raising the bar because your country decided that now we want to fulfill the SDGs by 2030. And that changes everything. Because we want to be sustainable, but with, without hunger. We want to be sustainable, but without deforestation and without land degradation and with biodiversity conservation. So the bar is again, is again you know, higher than it was when we established 2014. So we have to do the two things at the same time, implementing and showing that yes, it, we can produce results, and at the same time that there are new challenges and we can do better and we have to adapt our efforts. Thank you very much and welcome to the third uh, GAXA meeting. Thank you very much, Mr. Castro, for these very inspiring remarks and call to action, and also for hinting in some of the direction that GAXA could go. Uh, I would now, last but not least, like to turn to Mr. Campanola to give, uh, I guess, a presentation on the new CSA source book. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's an honor for me to be here today. And it's my pleasure to introduce to you and to the CSA community, FAO's 2017 Climate Smart Agriculture Source Book. The second edition was developed in the, context, in the context of FAO's largest strategic program on making agriculture, forests and fisheries more productive and sustainable. It was recently launched at COP23 in Bonn. Today, the world faces two key interlinked challenges. The need to increase food production by up to 50% 50, 50 to feed nearly 10 billion people in 2050, and to do so while adapting to ever more threatening climate change and while reducing 
agriculture's own substantive contributions to greenhouse gases emissions. Climate smart agriculture is an important part of the solution to this challenge. SSA is also well positioned to make an important contribution to the sustainable development goals, not only for SDG 13 on climate change, but also on SDG 2 on zero hunger, food security, nutrition, and sustainable agriculture, and SDG 1, ending poverty. Climate smart agriculture integrates critical elements of sustainable food and agriculture. It recognizes the linkages between promoting resource use efficiency, conserving and restoring biodiversity, natural resources, ecosystem services, and combating the impact of climate change. But please, let's not forget to put people at the center of all this agenda. Uh, climate smart agriculture, agriculture also recognizes uh, the linkages between adaptation and mitigation. About 50 countries worldwide endorsed or even prioritized actions intended to harness the potential synergies between mitigation and adaptation in food and agriculture. Among those, 32 countries specifically refer to climate smart agriculture in their intended nationally determined contributions to achieving pledges made under the Paris Agreement uh, uh, in 2015. Half of them are least developed countries and three-fourths are from sub-Saharan Africa. We also know that many countries rely on CSA to drive their national agriculture investment programs, even if CSA is not specifically mentioned in their NDCs. FAO produced the second edition of the Climate Smart Agriculture Source Book to respond to this strong demand. It should support countries in reorienting their agriculture and food systems towards sustainable development and food security in the face of climate change. The SSA Source Book aims to support and guide policymakers, program managers, academics, extension services, and other practitioners. The source book contains 23 modules that focus on production issues related to crops, livestock, forestry, fisheries, and aquaculture, and integrated systems, as well as on the use of resources such as water, soils, and land, genetic resources, and energy. Food systems and values, value chains are incorporated as potential tools for optimization, while factors such as gender and social protection are also considered. The source book is an update of the first edition that was launched in 2013 and contains five new models. The first, investigating climate change adaptation and, and mitigation. The second, integrated production systems. The third, knowledge support systems for rural producers. The fourth, the role of gender. And the fifth, a theory for change on how to improve implementation. The source book offers a deeper understanding of the SSA, the CSA approach, and the related five steps of its implementation. This involves building the evidence base, strengthening national and local institutions, supporting enabling policy frameworks, enhancing financing options available at the local, international, and multilateral levels, and implementing practices in the field. It is designed as a living digital resource on a newly dedicated FAO web platform. This allows for continuous updates and integration of evolving scientific insights and practical experiences in the field. It's one of the first major corporate products of FAO delivered under new FAO climate change strategy. It also shows an important step in supporting FAO's official mandate to have climate change as a priority topic 
in the new biennium. I hope that you, representing the CSA community, will promote it and make good use of it. This new SSA, CSA source book has been developed for you. You can pick up flyers and get further information on how to access the online version of this, of this uh, source book in the hall outside this room. Please be active and help spread the information on this source book. And of course, uh, we all have the goal to reach uh, and to make agriculture, forest, fishes, and agricultural climate is smart. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Campaole, Campaola. Uh, and we're going to proceed with the agenda in terms of uh, setting the scene for the meeting. Uh, I'm sure you agree with me that what the three speakers have given us, actually very uh, elaborate and quite concise uh, elements that are very, very important for setting the scene for this uh, conference and setting the scene in the context of uh, providing some of the key elements we need so that we can go through the process of uh, of uh, examining what are the issues, learning from that, and embracing that in form of our strategic vision uh, and the ultimately program of work going forward. So myself and me are going to say just a little bit to add to what the three speakers have given us in terms of wrapping up that uh, uh, setting the scene scenario. Uh, and in that context, let me just say three things related to where we are today uh, in terms of the situation, and me is going to build on that uh, uh, looking forward. So the first thing is, uh, which also has come out from our three speakers, is that we're dealing with a subject matter that actually uh, is no more than a decade old in terms of uh, emerging as a global issue, as an issue that has actually provided some disruption in the way we think, in the way we uh, perform, and especially the way we farm. Uh, and of course, that has not been without controversies. There has been issues, continue to be issues, and some of those actually uh, contributing to the push and the pull that has brought us to where we are. And, and uh, I would say, in fact, that some of those had to be like that because the whole conversation around a new narrative on the way we interact with nature uh, was actually going to disrupt some of our comfort zones, was going to threaten some of the way we know best to do things, and therefore it could not go without uh, any of those controversies. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I think it's good also to appreciate that we're living in a time where there are actually major transitions going on at various levels, national, regional, continental, and global. And some of those things is an element of appreciating and being aware and uh, uh, understanding how they will impact on what we do and what we aim to do. Uh, in Africa, for instance, when you look at the demographics and the youth element in there, uh, you can't afford to ignore that in whatever you do in the development circles. Uh, I also want to mention in that context that within this period we have had quite major agreements, some of which has been referred to, SDG, the, the Paris Climate Agreement, uh, many of you would be aware also of the RDC Financing for Development uh, Agreement, the WTO Agreement in Nairobi, and all these are actually uh, agreements at continental level that are going to impact directly, indirectly on uh, our movement towards uh, uh, farming that is climate smart, or agriculture and food systems that are climate smart. Now, it's within that 10 years that you also look at uh, uh, the emergence of uh, GAXA. In uh, 2014, has been mentioned, uh, signing up officially, but of course, we uh, want to appreciate that that was preceded by uh, two or so years of very, very intensive negotiations, discussions, uh, uh, agenda setting, uh, 
uh, which actually then led to that agreement in terms of what do we do, how do we do it, and GAXA was the result. Uh, and as I said in the beginning, yes, it's three years, four years or so, uh, but uh, uh, we can say GAXA is now no longer a child, is an adult, but the issue and what we want to emphasize in these three days is that we don't stop to learn and we're going to continue to adapt to ensure that uh, GAXA remains fit for purpose. And that is why it's not a threat for us to re-look at the vision uh, and ensure that we continue to uh, adhere to the purpose uh, and ensure the vision is helping us in, in that direction. Uh, and therefore, uh, the whole structure of GAXA was mentioned is something that we can still discuss and ensure that it's actually fit for purpose and enabling us going forward. The issue of membership has been mentioned in what is changing, uh, but also one element that many people ask is uh, what actually do you do as GAXA? And, and that has evolved over these three years. Uh, sometimes sounds like a trivial question, but it's important, and the more it has been asked, the more it has helped us to actually be precise be concise and clear on exactly, yes, indeed, what do we do as GAXA. And I just want to mention these three things in terms of convening the networking and dialogue uh, around an issue that is uh, uh, touching all of us across sectors, across levels, uh, in terms of climate smart agriculture. Mm -hmm. We also broker partnerships and the, and the collaboration. Uh, we develop decision-making support tools uh, the matrices is uh, one example, uh, and also organized to respond to the knowledge and information gaps in that process of engaging, of dialoguing, of finding solutions and understanding problems in advancing climate smart agriculture. And of course, appreciating that climate smart agriculture, like I said, is, is new and evolving and evolving very fast and therefore keeping pace is important. Uh, and lastly, just uh, in terms of some of the achievements related to what I've said, this uh, is actually contributing to the growing consensus, uh, even in diversity on the issues of climate smart agriculture. It's, uh, it's also in that process actually contributing to this need for new narrative on how other people interact with nature, uh, especially within the issue of agriculture and food systems. Uh, we also, uh, in terms of achievement, have come up to a situation where you can say, yes, uh, uh, trust is, is built among the various constituencies and therefore can have objective, open conversation and dialogue in uh, moving forward on the whole aspect of uh, climate smart agriculture, also in relation to the triple, triple wins. Uh, and, and of course, connecting policy, information and financing, uh, including science, and also connecting vertically from community, national, regional, and global level. So those are some of the elements that uh, would like to uh, articulate further, understand further, and look at what and how do we go forward within that context. So at this point, let me uh, invite my colleague, me, to actually just build on that and very much referencing to the strategic vision document that uh, you, you have in your folders. Thank you, Martin. And very briefly, to launch our discussion, uh, I just wanted to stress three things. First of all, uh, this annual forum in intends to be very forward-looking. Um, I think that the speakers highlighted the, the milestones that, that uh, happened uh, in the past two years. And then when I was in New York uh, at the New York Climate Week, uh, as well as the UN General Assembly, the two words that kept coming, kept, kept coming up were scale and uncommon collaboration. And GAXA is really trying to achieve that and recognizing that climate smart agriculture is knowledge intensive and context specific. There is no silver bullet, but we know that there are silver linings. There are solutions that work and we're really trying to bring that dialogue and process and collaboration closer to action on the ground. So, Members are actually uh, the ones who deliver action on the ground. So I think that what the second message we want to stress is that the how matters as much as the what. And the how is how to connect action to try to achieve a result that is greater than the, collect the, the, 
the addition of our individual actions. So that's what we try to do in terms of ideas and in terms of people. The annual forum has a strategic vision that we are proposing to achieve. Uh, please make sure that you go on the website and look at the strategic vision because we want to have your input. It builds on the trending uh, issues that had been identified at the last annual forum, including taking holistic and integrated approaches, such as landscape approaches, as well as a food systems approach along the value chain, and the importance of empower farmers, women, and youth. So the annual forum is a three-day event that, would look, that has been designed to look at that, with the first day looking at work and results of each of the action group, and starting with a session on partnerships in action. Whereas the second day will look at the collaboration we have started uh, with the regional alliances and our regional level engagement. And the afternoon, which is very important, is the breakout sessions where we're going to look at how and we'd like to have your proposals on how we can concretely move forward uh, that work so that in the strategic committee and technical meetings on the third day, we can actually operationalize that into action plans and adopt a strategic vision. Also, please remind, be reminded that there's a CSA speaker's corner in the flag room on the ground floor where uh, you can have the opportunity to either disseminate some of the tools that exist or learn from them. Um, and on that note, uh, I think that without further ado, we will open this annual forum. Thank you very much. And let's get to work. All right, there we go. Good morning, everyone. My name is Ernie Shea, and I'm the chair of the GAXA membership engagement team. And speaking on behalf of our team, I can't tell you how thrilled we are that the annual forum task team has chosen to focus on members in action at the opening session here, because I think that really speaks to what each of our initial speakers has set up in terms of the challenge. This is a time for action. This is a time for the diverse makeup of the Global Alliance for Climate Smart Agriculture to rise up, to show what we've been doing, and more importantly, to demonstrate what we're capable of doing going forward. This is a very special time in the evolution of climate smart agriculture. We have been gearing up for the day when there would be a platform where the agricultural landscapes would be recognized for the solutions that they can provide. And now that the COP process has, in fact, validated that work plan, all eyes will be looking at us and our diverse partners for leadership that we can provide, for actions that we can take that will address the three pillars of climate smart agriculture. And that, in fact, perhaps more than anything else, is what differentiates us from the work of other partners, because we are focused on all three pillars, not just one. We have to figure out how we can sustainably intensify production to feed a global population that will exceed 10 billion people mid-century. We have to adapt and become more resilient. And along the way, we have to maximize the solutions that we can deliver from agricultural landscapes. Climate change is something that is so big and so all-encompassing that governments alone cannot solve it. 
It takes a multi-stakeholder collaboration such as what we have in the room today and across the world where we bring governments, farmer organizations, NGOs, businesses, uh, any and all type of partners to the table to contribute solutions and to work together. So our theme this morning over the next 70 minutes is partnerships in action. And we're very fortunate that we've been able to attract a very uh, progressive group of GAXA members who have been forming unique and innovative partnerships, leading by example and getting work done on the ground. We convene at forums like this to talk about what we do, but the action takes place on the ground. And our panel today each will be taking a slightly different perspective, uh, giving you examples of these diverse partnerships and how they're contributing real valuable results. So the plan for this morning is for me simply to briefly introduce the five panel members. Each will have approximately eight minutes for an opening statement. We'll then have a round or two of questions that I'll pose uh, to keep them on their toes and then we're going to open it to you. So please be thinking about partnerships that you have, partnership challenges that you face, partnership opportunities that you'd like to exploit, because these individuals have been deeply involved in the creation of partnerships, and I'm confident that their experiences and their insight is going to be valuable for you as you go forward in your own uh, area of focus. So our panel today is uh, composed of a cross-section of GAXA members that represent the communities of interest that, com that uh, represent GAXA. Our farmer uh, presentation is going to be led by Vivi Sadamati, and he's going to be talking about innovative farmer-to-farmer -farmer extension operations in India. And uh, he is with the National Council for Climate Change, Sustainable Development, and Public Leadership. Our research community today is going to be represented by Evan Gervetz, and Evan is going to be talking about catalyzing climate smart agricultural research from the perspective of his work at the International Center for Tropical Agriculture. Our third community of interest uh, in GAXA is the NGO community, and today that's going to be represented by Zio Ken Devine, who is going to be talking about mobilizing youth awareness and participation, perhaps one of the most critical communities of interest that we need to rely on for leadership and action. And he is with the uh, Climate Smart Agriculture Youth Network. Our fourth community of interest that's represented on the panel today is our important business partners. And today our business community is being represented by Bernard Moritz Storm with Yara, and he's going to be talking about examples of diverse partnerships uh, in his world of fertilizer and nutrient management. And finally, uh, we obviously need governments involved in GAXA, and our government community of interest today is represented by Simona Caselli, and she's going to be talking about the role of sub-national governments. Oftentimes the national level governments get a lot of attention, but as we saw at COP, there is a critical role for subnational governments to play, and she's going to be talking about what's been happening in the Emilia Romonga region in Italy, where they have a very uh, interesting and growing collaboration of diverse partnerships working on delivering climate smart agriculture solutions. So that's the setup partnerships in action, be thinking about how their experiences are transferable and scalable back in your world, and we'll look forward to your questions. So with no further ado, I would like to invite uh, Vivi Sadamati to uh, come to this podium and deliver your remarks. All right, thank you, sir. Members from the Dias and uh, very distinguished participants from all over the world. At the outset, uh, let me thank uh, GAXA for giving me this opportunity. And I shall be, you know, in the next six or seven minutes, I shall be taking a snapshot of, you know, innovative farmer-to-farmer -farmer extension operations in India. 
I mostly I shall be sharing Indian perspective. You know, this paper was to be presented uh, originally by Dr. Shilat, who is a member of your strategy committee. But you know, he got busy and then was not able to make it. So I am very happy that he was not able to make it. So I got a chance to, you know, share my views, you know, with this international community. You know, I shall take you through, you know, five to six segments. And the PowerPoint flows like this. You know, first, one or two transparencies, I shall be talking about uh, you know, National Council for Climate Change. Very briefly, I'll explain about its activities. Then the second segment, we shall deal in detail about, uh, you know, India, farm sector achievements and challenges. Third segment, you know, we will have extension operations promoting, you know, farmer to farmer transmission of information. And there are various models. We shall take, you know, again, very highlights of you know, each one of those models. Then organizers wanted us to deal with, uh, you know, what are the innovative actions that we are, you know, grounding in the field. And then also organizers wanted us to indicate, you know, just one or two big challenges if we have to deal with, uh, you know, climate smart action actions in the field. And finally, one or two transparencies on sum up. The organization which I represent is a civil society organization, was established in 2010. You know, Professor Swaminathan is its uh, patron. And you know, we have members from all over the, uh, all across the sectors representing varied experiences on the climate smart agriculture. We cover about you know, 2,000 villages and 300,000 farmers and 600 field extension agencies are you know, connected to our uh, programs and actions. We have a pan-India presence, however, we are very active in the state of Gujarat, which is a combination of you know, irrigated and rent-fed agriculture and Maharashtra. And, uh, our council is very closely associated with GAXA, COP, UNFCC, etc. Its a mission is, you know, if I have to, you know, just put you know, two words. One is it's a premier organization at the national level for dissemination of climate smart agriculture information. We are very much involved in proposing the policy actions you know, to the government and non-government organizations. And while doing so, we organize you know, a lot of interfaces, network programs at the national and international level. This transparency will uh, indicate India's achievements in uh, you know, food production, in fruits and vegetables, there's horticulture sector, milk, fish, meat, poultry, etc. There are, uh, you know, despite our achievements, there are you know, a couple of challenges, and one of the very major challenges, uh, vulnerability to the climate change and regional imbalances. And the last bit is, you know, the program delivery and efficacy of the extension services. This is where I shall be concentrating on the uh, next couple of minutes. When it comes to, you know, extension services, as, uh, you know, it is happening in other countries, India is providing extension services through, you know, four or five major models. One of them is, you know, public sector extension, you know, the public sector extension funded by the you know, governments, the research organizations, and we have a, a large number of you know, chains of agriculture universities and Indian Council of Agriculture research organizations. And they basically, you know, generate the technology, test the technology, and validate the technology. And while doing so, they involve, you know, innovative farmers, progressive farmers, and they act as, 
you know, extension agents for transmission of information. When I talk about the public sector extension, again, you know, we have, you know, series of development departments like agriculture, horticulture, animal husbandry, dairy, poultry, fishery, soil conservation, etc. Basically, what has been tested on the ground by the research organizations is taken up by the development departments for upscaling, and there also involvement of farmers is very major. Then the third stream is, you know, private sector extension service providers who are promoting, you know, farmer to farmer, you know, climate smart information. Here, you know, you have, uh, you know, agri entrepreneurs, input support agencies, companies and corporates, and basically, you know, they supplement extension efforts while promoting their own products. Then, you know, we have, uh, you know, farmers and farmer organizations coming up, you know, throughout the country, you know, for the commodity organizations, and they promote large number of, uh, uh, you know, members, and, you know, transfer information, you know, to the members through, you know, cooperatives, farmer organizations, farmer producer companies, so on and so forth. Non-government organizations are another very major player in the government of India's extension efforts. Media is playing a very important role, especially nowadays, you know, the social media is coming up in a big way. If I have to analyze the information about um, how these models are, uh, you know, functioning, then there are three or four, you know, take-home points that we have to promote, you know, pluralistic approach, let the different models, you know, work for climate-smart agriculture, each one will have to have you know, different and specific role, and that role will have to be defined in you know, a county level or a block level or a cluster level plans. Uh, we need to have you know, critical reforms and extension operation if we have to make you know, extension services effective for the climate change, like you know, involvement of the farmers, bottom up planning, operational flexibilities to the field functionaries, right kind of you know, priorities depending upon the field conditions, and uh, farmer promoting farmer empowerment models and involvement. There are uh, you know, a couple of initiatives which we have taken up. One is Farm Science Center, what we call it, what we call it as uh, Krishi Vidyan Kendras. They are operating at the district level with a team of the scientists and promote you know, validation of the technology on the farmer's field which is taken up, you know, from those experiments to the, you know, farmers by the agricultural technology management agencies, they are with the development departments. We have, you know, taken up uh, a good number of, you know, initiatives, but one of them is the village level climate smart committees. And, uh, you know, we are working with, uh, you know, Florida University, and, uh, you know, Florida University scientists have visited, uh, you know, state of Gujarat. We have identified, you know, critical areas, 12 critical areas have identified where we are going to promote farmer volunteers, and they will work with, uh, you know, 13 districts and promote, you know, climate smart messages. Biggest challenge is how to make it happen on the ground, and biggest challenge is how to make the extension services oriented towards climate smart agriculture, to sum up, uh, you know, various models, farmer to farmer extension I mean, has to be promoted because that is where the action lies on the ground. And uh, we strongly, you know, propose that, you know, our organization works with international agencies and, you know, we should promote, you know, both knowledge and actions on the ground. These are going to couple of snaps. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Dr. Sadamati. And now we're going to hear from our research partner, and that will be the message delivered by Evan Kravetz. Evan? So when I got into research uh, a bit over two decades ago, uh, my motivation was to change the world. 
right? I think even I think a lot of us are here today. I mean, that's that's why we're here is is to change the world in a better way for uh, using climate smart agriculture. And in doing my research and seeing others do their research, one of the things that, that I've taken home is that research alone cannot change the world. It can provide a lot of evidence, and that, that was what I intended to do, and, and I think a lot of what my colleagues do. But it's through the partnerships is really where research can make a difference in this world. And it's not just about the research product, but it's the process of how you do it, and really how do you embed the research within our partnerships. And that's one of the things I want to I want to touch on today. I, I want to start by, by stepping back and talking about some of the typical climate smart agriculture technologies and practices that, that we think about. And a lot of great research has gone into this drought tolerant maize, for example, um, and, and partnerships that have gone into this also for how do you get this out, this maize out to farmers engaging with the private sector, um, with seed companies, uh, with extension, etc. Same thing with uh, say water management technologies. A lot of research has gone into this um, partnerships between research organizations and then partnerships to get to get this out. Um, but today I, I want to uh, think broader and bigger is one of the things. Uh, this still needs to happen. A lot of research on the technologies uh, are important. Um, but first I want us to think, uh, taking these success, these success stories, how do we think bigger? And, and the first way I want to think about uh, talk to you about is how we can put this together, all of this research into something here that's presented as the CSA Compendium, a, a new web tool um, that's been put out by my colleagues at the World Agroforestry Center, I should say, will be put out soon. Um, it takes a big data-driven approach to scouring the literature of, uh, they started with over 150,000 articles, putting it together into this kind of interface that you can query, or you will be able to query, and assess how different climate smart agriculture practices perform across the three indicators or the three pillars of CSA uh, against different indicators um, to give you real data that can be implemented within the, the work, uh, used within the work that, that you do. Um, but really this needs to be embedded within partnerships as, as I was mentioning. And so the first example I want to turn to for how this kind of information can be used um, is some work that, that my team has done with the World Bank in supporting their investments in climate smart agriculture. Culture. And so the World Bank came to SEAT and to CCAFs uh, and asked us to help them to give them a, a context. What are some of the entry points for climate smart agriculture at the national level as they plan their investments uh, for agriculture across the world? Um, these highlight uh, key risks, key vulnerabilities, uh, key climate smart agriculture interventions. Also looks at some of the policy, finance, and institutional um, issues that need to be addressed in implementing CSA. And then in Kenya, we worked with them to go down uh, to a finer scale to support the implementation of the $250 million Kenya Climate Smart Agriculture Project. And for this, we looked at four value chains in each of the Kenyan counties, uh, the 24 Kenyan counties, uh, where the World Bank uh, Climate Smart Agriculture Project was being implemented, and looked across the value chain, not just on farm, but from the provision of inputs to on farm production to harvest, storage, and processing to product marketing, to look at what are some of the key risks and vulnerabilities in each of these four value chains in each of the counties, what are farmers currently doing to cope with those uh, risks, and then what could they be doing? So this is an example of embedding our research within the World Bank's uh, investment planning and implementation. And this has been done uh, throughout the world, not just in Kenya, but in more than 30 countries globally where this has been done, and many more are in the pipeline where we're, we're starting to work. Uh, and then subnationally, I mentioned in Kenya, uh, in, 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 in many counties there, and then also in Mexico and the Philippines. Um, we're getting demand from other countries. We hear uh, Tanzania, Nigeria, others that where we're talking want to see this type of approach brought to them and embedded within the work that they're doing um, with multilateral banks, but also within their government uh, planning and, and implementation. So now I want to turn to engaging with the private sector, taking still this type of approach, um, but, but bringing it to a private sector perspective. And here's where my colleagues have worked um, on the cocoa value chain in West Africa um, to first map out a risk of gradient. So as I mentioned before, we need to assess uh, the, the, the impacts of climate change um, that is done in the profiling. And, and here, how they do it is to break it up into three different categories. Uh, areas where cocoa in the future is probably going to be alright. Maybe some, some minor adjustments are, are going to be needed, um, but not major changes to the suitability to growing cocoa there. Then areas in the yellow where 
some more major adjustment is going to be needed. And then areas in red where it looks like major transformation is needed in, into the system. They then convene uh, the value chain actors along that exposure gradient, that impact gradient of, of little to, to greater impact. Uh, analyze and prioritize different climate smart agriculture interventions, bringing in economics, cost benefit analysis, um, different types of analyses like using that, uh, potentially using that CSA compendium to look at how different technologies perform across the three pillars of climate smart agriculture, and then ultimately construct uh, portfolios for investment in climate smart agriculture in each of those three uh, different types of areas, the, the, the low, medium, and higher impacts, because different types of interventions um, need to be uh, implemented there. This is helping to de-risk the value chain and, and arguably then can open them up um, to better access to finance, um, better uh, ability to see how insurance could be brought in because you understand the risk better and you're doing things to cope with those up front. So from here, we have an investment portfolio. Next, I want to turn to how we're working with partners to design innovative finance and business models for scaling up climate smart agriculture. So taking some type of, some set of interventions, a portfolio, and then how do you scale that up? What, what are the, the, the models that are needed? And so here we're working, um, actually embedding our research within a, a care uh, uh, NGO care project in Tanzania, working with Wageningen University and with Sokwini University in Tanzania to see how the model of bringing a village savings and loan association together with a farmer field business school provides a model for scaling up climate smart agriculture. That if you have the knowledge from the business, farmer field business school, you have the savings uh, and you have the credit capacity uh, from the village savings and loan association that enables you to, to scale up, to implement and scale up climate smart agriculture. Bringing in the role of farmers organizations uh, and groups and input suppliers for providing the inputs. Linking this to the soybean value chain, so it's promoting, pr promoting soybean ultimately for resilience, nutrition, poverty, and equity outcomes. And we're doing the research around how does this business model work within the context of a care program that they're implementing in, in Tanzania. Now there's other types of services that are needed uh, that we should be doing and are doing research on. Uh, colleagues doing research on climate services, um, looking at, at forecasts in the short term and in the longer term, let's say seasonal forecasts. Um, bringing that to farmers, working with the Met Agency, embedding themselves within the Met Agency of Rwanda, then working with farmers to understand and farmer groups to understand what kind of information do they need, what should we be bringing to them, and then delivering that through information communication technologies and other ways to bring that information to them. Um, other services like insurance, I think very critical for us to be doing more research on this. Uh, I want to highlight a, a roadmap that my colleagues at CCAFs just launched um, uh, last two weeks ago in Nigeria for uh, how Nigeria can, can, can foster um, uh, the development of, of, an, of agricultural insurance, looking at the regulatory environment, looking at public-private partnerships, and looking at how they can pilot, uh, do pilots, evaluate it, and have learning processes uh, from that. So uh, to summarize, um, we, we want to be driving agricultural transformation. And I think often in research, uh, we focus in the circle down here on, on climate adapted, low emissions technologies. And that's great. We need to be doing a lot of that work. At the same time, I challenge us to be thinking more broadly to look at climate advisories, early warning services, to look at the credit and financial services, to look at the role of farmers organizations, policies, the private sector, public-private partnerships, agricultural insurance, uh, safety nets, these type of things to provide the support services around. And to do this, I think we really need to be embedding ourselves, our research within our partners and doing our research for them. It's not even research for development, it's really research in development, research in the private sector to be able to, to really inform um, the, their decisions and, and as I said, to, to change the world ultimately as I hope with my research. Thank you. Thank you very much, Evan. And now we're going to switch over and hear from the NGO community. And Zioka and Divine is going to be talking about leadership within the youth community. I'm sorry, I have a quote. Yeah, to come divine is my name, um, and I'm happy to be here. Uh, thanks to GAPSA and the entire facilitation unit for getting me right here. Uh, it's been a very, very long journey. Back in 2014, when I committed to, to join uh, 
GAXA in ensuring that young, youth voices are actually articulated at the level of the Global Alliance. Yeah, we, we thought very wise that uh, for GAXA to achieve its uh, vision and strategic goals, young people have to be at the center of all discussions. So today I'm going to be talking about mobilizing young people awareness and participation. Yeah, um, I'm actually representing the CSAYN, which is the Climate Smart Agriculture Youth Network, which, um, which consists of volunteers, and uh, we are currently in 22 African countries, uh, Asia and the US and Europe as well. Yeah, it is, the program originated from the concern of young Africans on the impacts of climate change on agriculture, food security, the environment, and an interest to create awareness on young people. We are now in 30 countries, operational countries. Uh, we are equally supporting the global goals. We are translating them into local languages. As of now, we are counting 60 local languages across the continent. So you find the, the SDG in uh, Pakistan, Kenya, in Cameroon, local languages. Yeah, these are some of our strategic partners. And GACs have been at the forefront. Some of these other partners, the World Bank on Earth for Climate, the I in the Gene, the HRA, the IFA recently supported us to go to COP. We were five, six of us, but unfortunately, two people had visa issues. I don't know why young people should always be having visa issues, but I think this is a forum for us to address that as well. The Minister of Foreign Affairs present here. Yeah, um, as I said, these are some of the local languages. We equally went further to translate uh, some of the uh, goals into Madagascar local language because we realized that um, to achieve the 2030 agenda, there is this miscommunication. Uh, the UN has six local langu official languages, so we, realized, we thought the very well rise to, to live in leaving no one behind. We really thought of coming out with uh, bridging the gap by translating them in several languages to support the UN global efforts. And we are equally focusing on people, persons living with disabilities. I don't know if there's a Braille or a silent signer in this hall, because uh, that's equally uh, a target group which um, we at times um, leave out of the whole discussion. So why are we building on youth? Because um, young people have, they have a lot of ability and they are very, very, they have a lot of innovations as well. So we thought that tapping into their potentials was going to help us achieve our goals at CSAYN. So the goals of CSAYN is to encourage young people to develop their own ways of contributing to sustainable development at local level, national and regional levels by conducting social projects related on climate smart agriculture, raising awareness and creating a platform for information sharing among young people about CSAYN, CSA practices. Engage young youth and other partners on related sectors through special training activities where young youth will learn how to learn, how to develop their own team and lead their own social projects that address regions, context, priorities, and needs. So our partners, we have NGO Economia, uh, government, local farmers and local people, youth, communities, target groups, young people, smallholder farmers, women as well. So the mission is right there, raising awareness among the young women and men to enable them make decisions for the future in the agricultural sector, create awareness of related climate change and agriculture, make youth aware of contributions they can in agriculture across sector for a better future, especially through the application of climate smart practices in both agriculture and forestry. The vision is actually to engage young people worldwide towards resilient environment through CSA. So these are some act, um, actions in some countries. We see Rwanda in partnership with SAO, Ghana established SGC schools. In Mali, we were able to organize academies in tree planting. In Togo, they were able to attend the African Climate Forum, where the CSA team in Benin was established. In uh, Ivory Coast, we were able to meet the bank, at the, at the bank to discuss how we can establish smart farms 
Zimbabwe, Morocco, Nigeria as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for that presentation, Ms. Yoakum. And now we're going to turn to our business partner community, and Bernard is going to lead us in a uh, discussion about what the business community is doing. So, Bernard? Thanks, Arne. So I'm very pleased to be given the opportunity to talk uh, about the uh, business uh, way of working through partnerships for climate smart agriculture. So first just a, a brief word on who we are as Yara. We were founded in 1905 in Norway and we were the first company in the world to manufacture fertilizers on an industrial scale. Today we are a global leading company in the fertilizer industry with uh, people on the ground in more than 60 countries. So I want to talk in particular on how we partner with others on two key pillars. So first on the mitigation and second on the productivity pillar. And I think we all agree that if we can measure it, we can take action on it. So in order to mitigate emissions from the agriculture sector, you need to have an awareness of where your emissions occur and to look into the options you have to reducing them. So this partnership uh, originated about one decade ago when you had a group of scientists working at the University of Aberdeen and they were tinkering with an Excel spreadsheet to model the greenhouse gas emissions coming from agriculture and, and soils. And this work was led by Pete Smith who was the lead author of uh, two of the IPCC assessment reports on land-based emissions. And about at the same period of time, um, a different company, fairly well known for its sustainability engagement, Unilever, were looking into their own scope three greenhouse gas emissions and they discovered that uh, about a quarter of their emissions originated from the agriculture sector, so producing the inputs that they needed. So Unilever reached out to the University of Aberdeen to get some assistance in looking into how they could mitigate these emissions. And this led, this was the first steps leading into the, what is today the Cool Farm Alliance. So the team at the university wanted not just to do calculations for one single company, they wanted to create a tool that had a more universal applicability and that could be used across, uh, across industries, across uh, geographies, across crops in order to uh, calculate the uh, greenhouse gas emissions associated with farming and the inputs to help people look at what the mitigation options were. So today there are 24 partners uh, included in the Cool Farm Alliance. Uh, due to the uh, sponsoring of this development of the tool, uh, it is uh, it's, uh, available for free as an online tool for farmers. We as corporate companies have to pay something to you to use this to sponsor the continuous development of this tool. And it's uh, being further developed to look into uh, water smart agriculture and looking into the biodiversity dimension of, uh, of farming. So why are we as Yara engaged on this? Our CEO has said that we want to welcome a healthy competition on reducing carbon footprints. So we are taking actions in our own production system, installing catalyst systems that help reduce our emissions by half, hence reducing also the LCA of carbon footprints on agricultural produce. But we're also working to help farmers optimize the use of our products. So using less fertilizers to produce more produce. So in, in effect, helping for, uh, farmers actually reduce the consumption of our products so that they get a better return on investment and they can also reduce the carbon footprint. 
Second, I want to touch upon the farm to market alliance or the productivity uh, pillar. So the farm to market alliance uh, originates out of the World Food Program patient, uh, patient procurement uh, program. And uh, <laughs> the World Food Program figured out that it didn't make a lot of sense to keep on saving the same millions of uh, smallholder farmers over and over again. So they want to use their purchasing power to actually create a market to, for these smaller farmers so that they, they can, um, so that they can increase productivity with a guaranteed offtaker for their produce. And you can't find this anywhere in the pre-reads for the Farm to Market Alliance, but there is one particular risk on agricultural interventions that I would like to mention. Uh, that's the risk of success. You may actually risk that you work with farmers and you successfully help them increase their productivity. But if you don't have off-takers for that produce, the farmers will probably not be better off anyway because you risk that the local market prices collapse and the farmers end up in the same situation as before. So the Farm to Market Alliance uh, has been initiated in Tanzania where we <coughs> jointly now are reaching 70,000 plus smallholder farmers. And there was a stock taking earlier this year showcasing uh, productivity on plus 200% or more. Uh, consumption in the families who have been touched by this alliance up by 35%. And importantly, income levels for these farmers are typically up by about 500%. So increasing the income levels of the smallholders by enabling them to reach the markets is a critically important factor if you want to successfully help them increase productivity. So we as Yara, uh, this is one example on how we work with the smallholder farmers to improve productivity. We tell them to use the bottle cap of a bottle of water as a precision farming piece of technology. So for every maize seed, they should take one scoop of fertilizer of the Yara cereal and add as a preparation when you plant the seed. And then when the plant is about waist high, they should take one more scoop of fertilizer and use as a top dressing. And this is precision farming technology at a smallholder level, helping these smallholders to maximize the return on investment on their investment into our products. But our knowledge is only part of the equation here. This alone will not help them succeed. We need them to have quality seeds we need them to get training on the use of other agro agrochemicals as needed, and we need them to get affordable finance, insurance, and importantly, connection to the market. Otherwise, such an intervention will not succeed. And just briefly mentioning the replicability of, of this. If you want to build a successful value chain, we always start by working with the off-taker. If there's a buyer, we can combine our forces with others and we can help the farmers deliver to the buyer. So the off-taker is really the key here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bernhard. And last but certainly not least, we're very fortunate today to have Simona Caselli with us. Uh, uh, Simona is the Regional Minister for Agricultural Hunting and Fishing for the Emilia Romagna region of Italy. And she's going to be talking about the role of the subnational government leaders in advancing climate smart agriculture. So, Simona, welcome. 
Thank you very much, and thank you uh, to the GAXA for the opportunity to present the experience of my uh, region. Uh, I think, uh, really, sub-governmental uh, um, region or uh, governments are, uh, could have a key role in this. Just to let you know where Emilia-Romagna uh, is, uh, you see we are in Italy, uh, we are in the center uh, northern part of Italy, uh, we are a region which is horizontal uh, and goes to, from a, a part to another of, uh, of Italy. Um, Emilia-Romagna is a leading region. We have a very strong agriculture. Here you can see some uh, uh, figures. Uh, we have uh, uh, one million hectares, um, 65,000 uh, farmers, and uh, uh, 65 farms, and um, lots of people working in the agri-food sector because the, we have uh, actually uh, 76,000 people working in agriculture, but we uh, have an agriculture which is based on value chain, so uh, in the value chain we have lots and lots of people working on that. Uh, our um, population is uh, for a million uh, and a half, uh, so uh, you must consider 300,000 people working in the agricultural value chain is really, really uh, important. Uh, here you can see some other figures on our output and our export, which is very, very important, considering uh, uh, also the, the amount of Italian export. Um, we have uh, 44 geographical indication, and I mention this because uh, our agriculture is based on this particular kind of model, which is a model um, which links people to the territory, to production, to everything, so is sustainable in itself because uh, uh, you must work on quality and you must focus on that. Um, so it's not a, a kind of agriculture based on the commodity point of view. Um, here you can see one of the most famous geographical indications we have, the Parmigiano-Reggiano, and we, we will open a wheel in, uh, uh, in one of the speaker corner uh, in the afternoon. But uh, um, we have uh, a huge uh, program, uh, which is the Rural Development Program, which actually every European region have. Uh, ours is 1.2 billion, and... Uh, Almost the half of it is devoted to environment and climate measures. Um, it's not only uh, the 510 uh, millions you see here, because uh, we also put in there more uh, three, uh, 32 millions from uh, uh, regional resources, because uh, we are actually very, very involved in that and we are very engaged. Uh, and, um, of course, uh, the, this rural development program is part of the uh, European strategy to reduce emissions of 20%. Uh, of course, we are affected by climate change. Here you can see some, uh, uh, some graphs uh, telling you uh, our average temperature is rising up and uh, uh, there's an increase in extreme events and length of drought periods uh, and the higher frequency or in the intensity of its waves. Uh, here you can see uh, what happened this summer. Um, this is uh, the Emilia-Romagna water balanced in uh, March, August uh, 2017, and uh, we had, um, I, I guess, the most severe drought in 120 years. And while I'm speaking, we have a problem of floods now in Emilia-Romagna exactly today. Uh, so that gives you the idea of what is happening, uh, which is uh, absolutely different. Uh, you see all the, 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 the figures with the minus. Uh, signed, uh, so it's really, really uh, a reality we have to face. Uh, so our policy is made by these uh, six uh, ways of acting, monitoring and data collecting, of course, uh, mitigation and sustainable productivity, adaptation, demonstrative project, innovation and training, and international partnerships. Uh, the monitoring is made by ARPAI, which is uh, our um, regional uh, system, which is also considered the, 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 the referring point at the national level. And uh, from 2019, Emilia Romagna is to host uh, the data center for European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecast. It will be based in Bologna in the Technopole. Uh, 
On the mitigation and sustainable uh, production measures, uh, of course, we uh, are uh, doing lots of things on organic farming. And now we have 11% uh, uh, utilize the agricultural area, but uh, we are trying to go uh, to 15% uh, uh, with the, the, the next uh, call. And uh, we have uh, another part in integrating production. So we have a quarter of uh, uh, our land which is used on the most sustainable uh, way. Um, of course, there's the rational use of water resources, uh, an increase in soil organic matter, uh, conservation agriculture, the reduction of emissions uh, in the livestock sector, which is quite important in our region, and we have to increase forest and carbon sequestration. Uh, Erie Frame on the adaptation is uh, one of the most successful um, experiment, experiments we, we made. Actually, it's used by um, 12,000 farmers, so it's not much of an experiment, but uh, it's a way of, uh, of doing agriculture. Uh, this is a system based on the data collected by uh, our meteorological system, and this advised the, the farmer uh, to what he has to do day by day. There's a voice, he, he listens in, in the telephone, so it's very, very easy. And this uh, helped us to, um, to increase the water sufficient of uh, uh, 47%. Um, we have demonstrate the demonstration project. Uh, the most important of it is the climate changer. We have some materials, uh, some uh, leaflets uh, uh, outside. And uh, the Help Soil project. The climate changer has been considered uh, one of of the best practices at the Italian level, so our government will present it to you, so I don't do it. Uh, but uh, uh, the project Help Soil is focused on uh, quality, on improving soil quality and strengthening the adaptation to climate change through sustainable uh, technology. Uh, the climate change involved lots of partners because we uh, involved the entire chain. Uh, for, uh, for pasta, for example, so cereal, pasta, varilla, uh, or the fruit and vegetables, and uh, uh, meat and, uh, and uh, cheese production. Uh, the other part is made by innovation and training. Uh, we decided to put 50 million of innovation uh, uh, activities in the Rural Development Program. Uh, some other regions did less, actually, but we decided innovation was really uh, important because of precision farming, of course, but also because there you can focus in, in a lot of things, and actually the 92 projects we funded up to now uh, were uh, for at least uh, half of them uh, related with uh, um, sustainable agriculture and uh, reducing emissions. Um, there is also the innovation and training uh, because it's important to focus on these new techniques and uh, to, to spread them. Uh, the number of farmers uh, uh, we uh, um, tried and uh, and um, uh, consider were 30,000 uh, up to now. But we are really, really interested in international partnership because uh, the experience we made with uh, the climate change was uh, really important because we try to measure the sustainability, also the economic ones, because otherwise the farmer won't do uh, the techniques you are suggesting. So that's why we decided to uh, find if uh, uh, this can be replicated with other partnership uh, we have around the world with California, with Gauteng, with Guangdong, and some other European regions. So this is really, really very important to us. And uh, to strengthen the international partnership for CSA, uh, we decided to join GAXA in July uh, 2017 uh, through a regional law, uh, so an act uh, with a political uh, force uh, approved by our legislative assembly. Thank you very much. Wow, that was an impressive overview of partnerships in action. And in each of those communities of interest, I was struck by how they were relying on partnership arrangements that were unique to innovate and scale up. So uh, thank you to all the panel members. 
So as your moderator, I get to ask the first question, and then we're going to open up to you. And I think I'll just go in the same order that, that we started with. So Dr. Samadhi, you did a great job of talking about farmer-to-farmer -farmer extension work in India where you're touching millions of producers and dealing with very different types of production platforms and systems. Can you, um, and, and we, we saw the process work that took so much to put in place, can you pick one example of an innovative action that's being scaled up across the area that you're working in that would be a tangible outcome? What would be a good example of that? Yeah, thank you, sir. Uh, if I had to pick up, uh, you know, one example where partnerships have been uh, kind of promoted, then I'll take uh, an example of, uh, you know, farmer empowerment. You know, we have, as I mentioned, we have a, a farm science center, or we call it as Krishi Vidyan Kendra, at the district level, and also agricultural technology management agencies doing development work at the district level. What we have done, we have promoted large number of you know, commodity groups, farmer organizations, and there you know, we have induced you know, climate smart agricultural you know, management messages. And you know, state after state, now you will see that you know, climate smart agriculture messages have been primarily induced and promoted through you know, these farmers' organizations. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Evan, you uh, were our research uh, uh, partner example. Can you share with us what, what probably is your main challenge that you need to overcome kind of on an ongoing basis as you work to respond to the, the research questions that are posed to you? What, what's the biggest challenge? Um, I mean, I, I think one of the big challenges is the difference in the, the timelines that research works on and that our partners often work on, especially when you think private sector, I mean all of them, governments, NGOs, that they often want answers today, yesterday, you know, maybe you get tomorrow or a, a, a little bit of time. Um, and research often takes time. And so I think it's, it's a challenge on both sides of uh, the researchers understanding that and adjusting. Um, you know what, what, what we do, and, and in a sense, I, I, I often say, you know, if if we're not there on the table because the timeline's going to go on, a decision's going to be made one way or another. If we can improve that decision even this much, because we can bring something, it's not perfect, it's not how we want it to be uh, in the perfect way as, as as a research community, but we're at least improving something there. And I think on the other side, it, it's also uh, with our partners to understand the time it does take to get the 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 right good answer, and then finding the happy medium where we can work together in in that sense. Thank you. Ziocom, I think you had said that you're now operating in 30 plus countries where you've established programs and youth networks have come together. Are you at the point where you have figured out how to more easily replicate that in country by country by country that you go to, or are there unique needs and challenges in each country that force you to customize the model that you use to create these youth networks? Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, uh, one of the main things we have, one of the main strategies we've been using are success stories from other countries. For example, in DRC, they are using uh, soil irrigation to promote or to improve on their rice production. So some of these videos were able to share to some other young people across the continent, and we're very, very interested to tell them that agriculture is the, is the way to go. And equally, we are equally using uh, agribusiness, I mean, try to, try to, um, use the technology, some technologies like transform, in transforming fruits, the normal fruits, into, into juice for them to be able to sell. So when they see that they get to have an incentive at the end of the day, they feel that is something for them to get involved in. And um, um, perhaps I would, I would, even though you didn't ask it, I would perhaps say one of the challenges in getting this done, it's not been easy because the network is actually a volunteer network where those who are very, very interested in agriculture, climate change, and equally seeing how they can share some of their experiences in the various rural communities uh, can join. But it's been very, very difficult to tell a young person 
please come and join here. I mean, in the future, you're going to have maybe a better research or intelligence in CSA. So it has really been very, very tough. But we are very, very happy that today uh, IFA uh, has actually uh, been supporting us to make sure that we get to our plan. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much. Bernhard, down in the end there, uh, you're the business anchor for us. And as, as we've witnessed over the last decade, in particular the last five years, businesses are stepping up and making very significant commitments. But how do you go about helping those businesses actually deliver? How do you get them to invest the resources that are needed to ensure that they can, they can deliver the commitments that they're making? That's a two-part question you're going to get. And then secondly, businesses compete. How, how, do you, how do you get them to set competition aside and share both the work and the credit? Uh, thanks, Ernie. I, I think there are no really straightforward uh, answers to, to those questions. Uh, I think with, with the example of the uh, Farm to Market Alliance, uh, what we see is that it is possible to have a pre-competitive space where you try to build complete value chains amongst partners who would otherwise frequently be uh, direct competitors. But I think in order to reach that scale you are touching upon, so uh, how do we actually move from seeing one company at a time being engaged and dedicated to uh, better climate performance into having uh, a true system transformation so that it's not just one on one company but that you see uh, the whole system changing. I, I think that is the critical question. And I think uh, one element to, to touch upon there is to look at the current proliferation of sustainability labeling that is in place, which hints towards a need in the markets to actually have proof points that your climate and sustainability performance is uh, good enough or above uh, the bulk of the markets. So if we can somehow perhaps in a forum such as this or through the World Business Council for Sustainable Development and other cross-cutting uh, cross -cross -cutting alliances and organizations can converge the standards so that we all talk the same language and use the same indicators, we would have an even playing field for competing on how to get to better climate performance. Uh, I think that is one critical step which would also uh, ease the discussion in the competitive space. Thank you very much. And Simona, um, congratulations on the great leadership that your region is providing. The subnational uh, government role is being well represented by your presentation, so thank you. Um, governments are often seen as top-down, mandating. How do you how do you bring along all of the value chain partners, all of the producers, when you're trying to affect the type of transformational change that you are and avoid that they're forcing me to do something and I want to do it because? How, how have you been finding the farm community in terms of reacting to what you're asking for? We, we have some, uh, some, uh, some luck because uh, uh, many of our uh, value chains are built on cooperatives, so uh, they already put people together. Some other are based on uh, big uh, corporations which have a social responsibility issue to, to, uh, to cope with. But uh, in general, our government uh, is, has this, um, this way to act. Uh, by uh, considering people and to, uh, in a way, uh, co-work uh, co and, uh, and co-project uh, with them. Uh, this is really important because the climate change uh, um, activity was made before uh, decided how to, um, to, 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 to organize the rural development program. So we based uh, the, the way we wrote the Rural Development Programme on the experience we were doing in the, this particular life project. So this was really important because they, uh, they could see their efforts were recognized by the way the, the politics was uh, uh, 
uh, decided to compile this uh, uh, important, uh, uh, the, the, this important uh, um, uh, program, uh, which is uh, uh, the, the, the base of the resources we have uh, to, to spend in our agriculture. So uh, by being considered, uh, of course, they, they are more and more uh, engaged with us. Uh, but now what is interesting uh, is we are trying to measure the results. So we could uh, obtain the 20% uh, um, uh, less uh, emissions, which were part of, uh, of our goal, but on the other side, we could measure uh, the results uh, on the economic point of view. So we could uh, um, demonstrate the farmers uh, the new way of working, the new techniques we ask them to use are sustainable. And this is absolutely important because I can do the best effort or find the, the, the newest techniques uh, but uh, if it's not uh, feasible on the economical point of view, they won't, they won't use it. So it's uh, absolutely important. And also by working on uh, the value chain, you also protect the farmer. Because otherwise the farmer is always uh, in, the, in a situation of uh, financialization of commodities and so on. So we have to stay away of that and we have to... Uh, point out the farmer is the first step of uh, a, a, a building of the value in which he has to be considered because the, uh, the, the climate change or the, the, the climate smart agriculture be, begins in the field. Thank you. Um, one last maybe general question and then we're going to throw it to the audience. Uh, me, during the setup uh, earlier, uh, reminded us that there is no silver bullet here. These are complex challenges that we're trying to solve that require multiple solution pathways, multiple, multiple players. Uh, and as we look across the world, we find leadership emerging in multiple areas, people working on soil health, people working on nutrient management, people working on greenhouse gas emissions. And oftentimes they're very passionate about their work in those silos. But they're part of something bigger. They're part of delivering climate smart agriculture solutions. Have you experienced some of that narrow siloing work and perhaps creating some challenges and getting them to integrate and come together to advance a bigger solution? And if so, how have you overcome that? How, how have you validated their work in relation to others but helped show how it's something bigger? Any? Thoughts there related to partnerships on these multiple solution pathways? Uh, you know, there are a number of uh, examples, you know, promoted by the you know, government departments, by the research organizations, by the non-government organizations civil society organizations, so on and so forth, on uh, you know, climate smart agriculture, though they appear to be sporadic. However, you know, the moment you, know, you have a, a good networking arrangement, you know, perhaps you know, it gets scaled up, that is number one. Number two, I have uh, you know, tried uh, in Maharashtra, in Gujarat states, that, you know, if there's uh, isolated, sporadic innovations, if they become part of the, you know, block plan or a cluster plan or a village plan of agricultural extension, you know, then it gets linked to the money and it gets, <coughs> sorry, linked to the scheme. And that is how, you know, it gets upscaled. So this is, you know, my submission that, number one, you know, upscale it through a good networking arrangement, locally, regionally, nationally. And second one is, get the innovation picked up and put it in a plan. Whether it's a village plan or a cluster plan or a block plan, it gets upscaled. Thank you. Uh, to, to add to that, I, I think there's a, an important role for multi-stakeholder initiatives, multi-stakeholder platforms, public partner, uh, public-private partnerships um, in in addressing this issue. That I see it as as bringing people together 
um, that come from d diverse areas and I think really you know, can foster this kind of, of dialogue to, to, to address the issue of everybody being in their different silo. Um, there's some examples that uh, CCAFS has worked on uh, in West Africa, uh, science policy dialogue, so bringing scientists together with policymakers as well as others to have a dialogue at the, at the national level. And we found in uh, this climate risk profiling work that I mentioned in Kenya at the county level um, that that brought together a diverse group of stakeholders. It was part of our project and product to develop for the World Bank, but in doing so, it created this platform of bringing people together. And I've now heard that independent of what we've been doing, they're now integrating this work into their county integrated development plans, and then that would go into the agricultural, uh, agricultural development in, in that county. No, I'd just like to, to second that. I think openness, uh, exposure to other stakeholders than the ones you work with on a daily basis and, and a bit of creativity is really key to get around those silos and, and, and open up and work in a different way. And just the example I mentioned on the Cool Farm Alliance and, and how this originated by Unilever connecting to the University of Aberdeen is one example on, on how uh, a straightforward request on, on mitigation options in agriculture led to a, an interactive tool that's no, now globally available for free for every farmer in the world who desires to, to use it. And also internally in our, our own company, our journey towards being part of that alliance started with uh, reducing our own emissions just because we had, not by chance of course, but we had over a decade developed a, a catalyst solution to reduce our, our own emissions. But we didn't stop by putting those figures into our annual reports and saying, look, we are doing good. We also took it three steps further, so developing the carbon footprint labeling of our products and also developing in-house capacity to do life cycle assessments on climate change, which enabled us to contribute to the Cool Farm Alliance. So it's just about, well, opening up your processes and engaging with stakeholders you do not work with on a daily basis. I think there were two other po quick points and then we're gonna have to move along. So, um, was it uh, Dr. Sanmati? To supplement, sir. Uh, you, know, sir you mentioned about you know, CCAPS program in India. Dr. Agrawal is the you know, key person. I don't know, he promoted uh, you know, what he called it as climate smart villages in the states of Bihar and Haryana. And then I was associated for evaluation of those you know, climate smart village programs. What I found that though the impact were isolated and uh, you know, siloed types, but what we did at the end of you know, my evaluation program, I suggested you know, certain parameters of those climate smart village programs were linked to omega schemes or major schemes. And you know, we you know, sat with Bihar government, we sat with Haryana government, identified the schemes and programs and identified you know, the elements which can be linked to the major schemes of the government. And it happened. And uh, I'm very happy to say that you know, Mr. Agrawal is uh, you know, spreading those climate smart village uh, you know, component in a number of other uh, states. So it's just a matter of you know, picking those elements which have gone very successfully in you know, a limited scale, link it to the you know, schemes and programs of the government. Thank you. Well, panel members, thank you very much for your contributions. Unfortunately, we are uh, out of time. We started late and we need to uh, let you get on with your coffee break. So what I think we'll do is invite you to pose questions that you may have had to our panel members. And if you could remain up here, uh, we can have that dialogue with you individually. Before the coffee break, though, we would like to take a a photograph of the uh, delegates that are assembled here today, and I'm going to turn our over to our photographer to give us instructions on where we're supposed to go. Um, and I'm assuming he'll want us to kind of scrunch in. So, Emna, are you going to come up and give him the instructions, or how do you want to do this? Uh, if you can all, as well, uh, go inside, and everybody in this uh, middle row, Center and uh, we, we, yeah, and we all get together. Everybody here. Yeah, you all go there, and then you come back, so we can have a nice view of the whole uh, audience. And smile. And smile. We're uh, ready.
ready to resume uh, the next session, which is on the enabling environment. My, my name is Mark Manis. I will be moderating. And we have um, distinguished colleagues uh, that will be panelists here, Alice Chicharin from Cornell, Paula Bazzuto from um, the, the panelists here, um, Laura Kramer and Germana Borchette, and also Ashley Nelson from the U.S. Department of Agriculture will be um, the rapporteur. So what, I, what I'd like to do is to start out and um, share with you some thoughts and insight about what we've been doing in the enabling environment in GAXA. And, and that's going to be covered by four brief segments. One, on the context for the enabling environment in GAXA. Two, on what we've done last year. Three, what we've been doing this year. And four, what's the way forward for us? So starting with um, the context for GAXA, I think you'll see on the screen, I, I wanted to, uh, to share with you all the fact that when GAXA was launched in 2014, there was a document that launched it, and it's called the Framework. And the foresight of, the, of the, the, all of us that helped establish GAXA recognized the need to establish certain action groups, and you're going to be hearing from all three of them today, starting with this one. And in that framework an, uh, document for GAXA, this, this is uh, quoting out of the text in terms of what this action group has been charged to do to integrate climate smart agriculture into policy strategies, planning, and funding mechanisms at the various levels that you see. So what I think the, the, uh, the, we've all recognized that an integral part of uh, what we're trying to do in climate smart agriculture in this alliance is what's the policy? What are those key policies that are uh, relevant for uh, moving forward with GAXA. That's the context. In terms of what we started doing in, in the first year of the launch of the uh, en Enabling Environment Action Group, we um, took the initiative to establish country case studies. And we had six countries that engineered, developed, and presented at last year's forum their case studies in climate smart agriculture. And they were Malawi, Tanzania, Costa Rica, Ireland, France, and Vietnam. And what the countries did in each of those case studies is they looked at certain aspects of climate smart agriculture, and that included the state of play on policies in their country, investments in climate smart agriculture in their country, technologies, uh, looking at metrics, the role of civil society within their country, and opportunities and challenges in the way forward. And, they, and these countries did present last year and that was good. And I think that it, it made sense for us initially to start with countries because they're uh, relatively um, engaged almost by definition in policy development. But as we move forward into this year, we recognize and appreciated that if you look at the, um, the makeup of the different uh, members of GAXA, about 20% are countries and the rest are other stakeholders. So what evolved this year, and what you're going to see from some of the panelists, well, from the panelists, some of those that participated this year, is the recognition that we needed to uh, not ignore countries, but look to other stakeholders. And, and that is indicative by some of the presentations you're about to see. So that's one. Uh, uh, movement forward, I would say, for the EEAG. And other, and then Allison will be getting into that in more detail, is not only did we look at 
case studies, but also we wanted to frame those. We wanted to put in context, and I believe we've handed out the, the actual framework document, of um, not only what did we do in previous last year with the countries and what we're doing with these, some of these other stakeholders, but also where are some of the gaps that are not currently being addressed by current or previous case studies and how does this all fit together? And we're going to get into that in a little bit. But the point is to this framework is intended to help guide us, all of us, in vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the different stakeholders and the different aspects that make up the whole continuum of policy and enabling environment. So please note that, and, and I'm highlighting what Allison will be saying. We want, to, we want to get your input on that, because I think that points to a way forward. So in, in terms of uh, what we're trying to do here in the way forward, we're looking, uh, in general, but in particular in terms of policy enabling environment, what are those, and how do we identify the technical policy and investment conditions needed to scale up agriculture. You, you've heard the theme mentioned this morning. You're going to hear it throughout the time here. It's, it's taking knowledge. It's taking investment. It's taking policy and scaling it up. And, and that's what we're going to be asking all of us to contemplate today, tomorrow, and on Thursday. We're using this opportunity right now uh, to share and disseminate. There's a lot of good work going on, and part of what I think GAXA is about is how do we get that out? How do we share what we're doing? Because the synergies that can emerge are awfully important. And we want to, by the end of this session on Thursday afternoon, promote, support, institutionalize the way forward on policy and policy reforms. So I want to highlight another thing for you in terms of after you hear from the Enabling Environment Group now, we're going to revisit it. We're going to revisit it with the three action groups. And it's in the agenda, but it's worth highlighting. And the point here is that we're going to be opening up each of these action groups to participation from everyone to help engage in and to develop the kind of work we want to do next year. And, and that's incumbent upon you. So we, we seek you to attend, uh, my own personal preference is to attend the enabling environment group, but the other two groups are equally important. And then we're going to pull them all together uh, at the end of the morning on Thursday. So it's an active engagement endeavor. We welcome your input. And uh, we also see that this is an opportunity to enhance this framework. It's a starting work in progress, and, and we think that it can be improved on, and we're looking to get your, your thoughts along those lines. So um, we're segueing into Allison, and Allison, uh, please, I've already identified where you're going to be talking about Go Forward and Conquer. Right. Thank you, Mark. It's a pleasure to be speaking here today. I was at the GAXA Forum in... Uh, last June, so this is great to be here. I'm from Cornell University in Ithaca, New York. If you're not, uh, if you haven't heard of us, please look us up. So I want today to introduce the enabling environment framework that we've developed. Again, as Mark said, it's a draft or a working document. We would really appreciate your feedback. And this was really developed by the entire committee under Mark's leadership. So I don't want to take credit for the for developing the framework, but I do want to explain it. My background is in global environmental politics. That's what my PhD is in. So it's really nice to be able to work to look at how the policy environment affects adoption and scaling up of CSA. So we can take this definition of an enabling environment that goes all the way back to 2001. That's really, it's a set of interrelated conditions. We think about the legal, what are the legal, organizational, fiscal, informational, political, and cultural factors that impact the capacity of actors uh, to engage in development processes. 
in this case in, in scaling up adoption of climate smart agriculture. And so some key questions I'd like you to think about as we listen to our case studies today is really what is the enabling environment to support CSA globally and in regions, countries, and local farming communities? And is it adequate? If you think about your own country, what are the barriers to, to a supportive enabling environment and what has worked well? How can CSA practices be scaled up from the local and regional level, but also from the global level down? And then what are the linkages between these multi-level policy mechanisms? So if you haven't heard of Eleanor Ostrom, I just want to provide framework for thinking about the enabling environment in terms of these multi-level actors that we heard about in the last session. And if you were at COP23, you saw non-governmental actors, sub-national actors, so many different actors engaging in governance, and we think about climate smart agriculture, the same is the case. So she's one of the most famous political scientists working on uh, environmental issues, and she coined the term polycentric governance, which really means that she says climate governance spans many spatial levels, from the international down to the local level, and it works through many modes and domains of action, including policies, markets, and networks. It is more diverse with a greater emphasis on bottom-up initiatives. But because there's a greater number of actors, there's more complexity and there's, a, there's greater innovation, but also a need for coordination, informa information sharing, and trust. So if we think about this global governance of climate smart agriculture, we do see a greater number of actors, even in GAXA itself, but we need uh, coordination and information sharing to make this work. So when we think about GAXA and the actors involved, we heard about this this morning uh, in the last session, uh, we have many different types of actors involved. And we think also about the enabling environment in terms of uh, policies at a global, regional, national, and local level, and how they all need to be uh, convergent. So this is the framework that we have developed. You have a copy here. And across the top are the different stakeholder, and on the left-hand side, the stakeholder groups that are a part of GAXA membership. And then if we think about the enabling environment, what we're trying to do here is identify areas for each of these groups to be um, helping push forward an enabling environment. So we see the context in which these groups are working, the policies that they can enact, uh, the types of institutions they represent, and what is the capacity for the enabling environment. Um, so again, another way of looking at this is that we have stakeholders, the context, the policies, institutions, and capacity all leading to an analysis of the enabling environment. And we're gonna really go into the detail on that in our four case studies. Is that the time? Oh, okay. So one of the last slides here is just a, a, a way of thinking about this multi-level enabling environment for CSA. And if we look up at the top at the global level, uh, GAXA is a key actor here in terms of helping with coordination, information sharing, analyzing gaps, needs, and opportunities. We also need to think about how GAXA is related to the new decisions from coming out of COP23 and the fact that countries are working on NDCs and on national adaptation plans. If we think about the regional level, what, are, what is the enabling environment there? We can think about our GAXA regional alliances working in different regions of the world. Uh, if we think about the national level, in your own countries, what are the national climate change and agricultural policies that are in place? Are they adequate or do we need to work on putting more um, adequate policies in place, laws and regulations? And then we think about another issue we're going to hear about uh, later today is the issue of climate change data, agricultural data and decision tools. Those can be developed by hubs or regions, subnational actors and the importance of research and extension services. And all of that really has to filter down or filter up from the local level, where ultimately decisions on climate smart agriculture need to be 
uh, taken by farmers in their communities. So key aspects when we think about an effective enabling environment is the importance of investing in, in these institutions that's essential for scaling up CSA. If we don't think about the enabling environment, uh, a lot of this will work won't take place. It's building capacity at all levels, reducing risk for farmer adoption. Um, and the enabling environment involves the framework conditions that facilitate and support adoption of CSA technologies by farmers. And these are the key aspects of an enabling environment if you think about whether they exist in your countries or with your groups. And a key message for GAC says that we need, there's a great need for coordination and what's called policy coherence across these actors and different levels. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Paulina. Thank you, Alison, and thank you, Mark, also, for the introduction. Hi, everyone. My name is Paulina Bisotto Molina. I'm from the European Center for Development Policy Management. We're a think and do tank based in Maastricht with a, an office in, uh, in Brussels. And we are an, uh, an independent knowledge broker. We try to do something of that coordination and, uh, and uh, knowledge uh, sharing role that's so important, uh, especially when we're talking about enabling environments. Um, we, as ECDPM's Food Security Program, have worked a lot on African uh, policy processes, followed the CADA processes uh, closely, supported uh, AUC and, and NEPAD and the regional economic communities uh, on, uh, on its implementation. That's the hardest part and I think that in the morning we've heard a lot about, um, about the need to, to, um, uh, uh, for, for effective implementation. Uh, and um, it's going to be about more than only the technical side of, of CSA. Um, last week, uh, my boss, Francesca Rampa, Francesco Rampa, was uh, in Johannesburg at the Global Science uh, Conference on CSA. Many of you uh, have also been there, I think. Uh, and it was on everyone's lips. It's going to be about policy research uh, to get things moving. So I'm going to ask you one question to think about, maybe for the rest of the day. Um, what is the biggest political elephant in the room in your country or in your work in your project that everybody knows is there and it's hindering implementation but nobody really talks about so just to leave you with that I'm gonna go to to the, the case study presentation uh, it's it's trying to um, uh, uh, use the the framework that was developed by the enabling action group um, on a, a case study in uh, strengthening consumer demand for uh, indigenous foods in Kenya um, and um, it's uh, based on a lot of work that's done before us, of course, by all of the very knowledgeable colleagues here in the room, um, and um, uh, taken also from a UNDP study that my colleagues have worked on, uh, and the uh, uh, project on sustainable agri-food agri system strategies, SAS, and it's easier, uh, that we'll be working on with, um, with Italian uh, universities um, from, different, uh, from dis different disciplines uh, working in, in Kenya and in Tanzania. Uh, for this presentation, the three main takeaways are what's going to uh, 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 really help a sustainable adoption of CSA is that ownership, adaptability, and politically smartness. So ownership at community level and at national level, the adaptability that there is no silver bullet but a silver lining as one of the previous speakers said, it's about testing out, learning, innovating, partnering and sharing and being politically st smart means also being opportunistic in, in many ways. So what kind of things will uh, the SAS research uh, uh, do? It's um, going to contribute to, uh, uh, it's really a food systems approach, like, uh, like uh, um, our colleagues from FAO are, are trying also to, um, um, to promote along the value chain. And it's going to look at a, at a very specific value chain, the ones of indigenous crops and indigenous foods, traditional foods. Uh, and looking at it from the consumer perspective, so the, the benefits in health and nutrition, also the benefits for, for farmers in producing these indigenous 
indigenous crops, uh, helping their, their farming systems to be more resilient uh, and uh, more productive um, and um, uh, more, um, yeah, like more resilient to, to, to climate change. Um, and by working together with, with, uh, with partners in, uh, in Kenya and Tanzania, uh, at this multi-level uh, governance, um, it's gonna strengthen the innovation capacity of stakeholders. Wow. So, um, as I said, ah, and maybe some of you have already noticed, <laughs> The pictures in the presentation are actually from Tanzania, not from, uh, from Kenya, so uh, uh, I'll excuse my, my, myself for that first. Um, but the um, uh, story about um, um, integrating uh, traditional crops in, uh, in maize food systems uh, is um, uh, qu quite, oh, sorry. Is, extremely relevant in Kenya as you all know like the the maize the mealy is 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 essential in uh, in in diets but it's actually uh, not such a sustainable uh, love um, that um, it's uh, uh, in many cases um, not drought resistant and um, um, Sorry, I lost my lost the thread. But um, uh, there is great opportunity to to um, to use um, uh, to revive the, the production of indigenous crops in these farming systems. So, uh, what does this uh, mean for the for the EAG framework? Uh, we're gonna we're looking at farmers' organisations, specifically their barriers for and farmers, <laughs> and not only farmers uh, organised in farmer organisations. Uh, what are the barriers for adoption of cl climate smart agricultural practices and uh, 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 integrating uh, indigenous crops is, is only one of them, but we try to focus. That's why. Uh, what is their their interest? In, uh, in adopting those, uh, those practices and what tools are there. And we really try um, to, um, to take up the, this from, um, from the, the, the it, it needs to, to make sense uh, for, uh, for the farmers in, um, uh, in their livelihoods. So um, it, uh, it can increase the productivity uh, and it will, um, this is all. But despite all these advantages that I already uh, that that are coming out of all the research, that uh, it's better for uh, for productivity, better resilience to to market shocks, to climate, to pests, to uh, reducing the use of chemical inputs, adoption rates are actually quite low. Uh, we've been uh, working in the in the Naivasha Lake area, and there we see that farmers still prefer like quick and easy solutions for uh, for better results. And usually, like you know, uh, climate smart. Agricultural practices can take a long time to uh, a longer time or it's, uh, to uh, to pay off. So here in this case, the, the direct enabling environment issues are that uh, extension services, for example, are uh, are, are biased to, towards pushing for uh, for staple crops. Well. Uh, and, and, and knowledge and, and, and promotion of these uh, more traditional crops is, is lagging behind. Um, the most um, it, maize is uh, is in, uh, uh, is, is the most uh, uh, invested crop in, in terms of, of new varieties, um, while there is much more scope for, for improvement in, in, uh, in, in, in these uh, more traditional crops. And there's also increasing uh, market demand for that. And it's not only about those, um, uh, and as Bernard, my, our previous speaker said, um, this um, it, it's going to be the market that, that's going to make farmers change their behavior. And it's not only linking them to global value chains, but especially these local markets that are, 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 um, are increasingly important uh, with trends of, of urbanization in Africa. Um, uh, that uh, that offer a, a big scope for these for these traditional crops as well. Um, so so here um, you can also think about uh, examples of, of uh, school feeding programs that link smallholders, uh, smallholder producers uh, that uh, produce these indigenous crops to uh, uh, to raise awareness of the nutritional uh, benefits of uh, of these crops. 
So um, the the private sector, the the, the um, uh, well, is going to be a, a great pool for innovation, but for innovation you will need all these different actors together to, uh, um, to create innovations in, in market, um, uh, market institutions. So FAO and INRA have, uh, uh, have done really interesting research uh, on, on these type of, of market innovations uh, where they see this, uh, there are different types of, um, uh, of ways to link consumers to more, tr more sustainable ways of production like participatory guarantee systems, uh, community supported agriculture systems and, uh, and uh, multi-actor innovation platforms uh, that can link these. So ex for example, in Kenya and Benin, uh, uh, it, it successfully linked producers of, uh, of spider plant uh, that many of you may know to, uh, to consumers in, in urban areas involving uh, researchers, local uh, uh, and regional international researchers, um, as well as policy makers. So, to, um, how am I for time actually? One minute, okay, so then let me see. get to the two reality checks that we've found uh, uh, in, uh, in our uh, research already is that it's key to understanding the diversity of farmers and consumers uh, and uh, maybe that's something that we can discuss when we are looking at the, at the framework. Uh, farmers are not always member of farmers organizations uh, they, or for some crops they, they do, uh, for others they, uh, they, they prefer to, to work as, a, as an entrepreneur um, and um, uh, th that's, that's going to be key to understanding their needs in terms of, 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 of policies and, uh, um, and uh, that's th those support services. Um, another uh, elephant of, uh, usually in the room in food systems and value chain work is that uh, they're, uh, most, of, most of the small farmers working in informal uh, chains uh, um, with, with their own um, uh, needs for, um, um, for policy reform for that, that policy makers are, are often um, neglecting or, or, or wanting to, to push aside while it is uh, a, uh, a key um, linkage between uh, small producers and poor consumers which if you if you don't address well you'll miss out uh, on uh, on a lot of opportunities so um, to, to stress the last point that solutions to uh, to, to uh, sustainably uh, adopt CSA practices is uh, uh, complex and um, it, the solutions cannot be very purely technical but need to be political too so that's why uh, I hope that we can discuss later those political elephants that uh, that you know and see if GAXA can also play a role in, 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 in tackling those elephants. Thank you. I'll give the word to Laura. <laughs> Hi everyone, as Mark said, my name is Laura Kramer. I work with the CGIAR research program on climate change, agriculture, and food security, otherwise known as CCAFs. Um, Evan up here earlier this morning is also from CCAFs, and I have some other colleagues in the room as well. Thank you. So today I'm going to uh, talk to you about our program. Our CCAFs program works on generating evidence about CSA practices and technologies, but then also using that scientific evidence to inform policies. So um, what I'm going to talk about today is not a single case study, uh, like some of the other presenters, but it's a collection of lessons learned from all of the projects and, and uh, activities that we do within CCAFs. And I'll talk about some of the best ways to engage between uh, scientists and policymakers and how to bridge the science policy divide, uh, what are some of the enabling factors, and also the constraints to policy engagement. So CCAFS works in five regions. Uh, you can see them on the map here. 
and we do on the ground participatory action research with farmers trialing different practices and technologies. Uh, but then we also work at subnational and national levels to use that evidence within policy making. And we also go up to the global engagement level um, with interactions at UNFCCC, GAXA, and other, other fora. And our work is policy oriented research. We want to create evidence, generate findings that are useful to policymakers, as Evan was talking about um, this morning. We don't want to just publish papers for the sake of publishing, but we want it to be useful to our partners and stakeholders. So we have regional program leaders within each of these regions. We also have uh, CGIAR center-led projects that work uh, with decision makers and we help inform policies, plans, and strategies. Um, so what I'm talking about today are some lessons that we've learned from uh, working with all of these people and it's based on interviews that I've done with some of our regional, pro all of our regional program leaders and project leaders and also their counterpart stakeholders within um, governments. And so the aim is to understand what works um, so that we can be more effective and share those lessons within our own program and with others so that the work we do can help better inform um, policies. So some of the types of engagement, uh, Evan's presentation this morning actually was a really good example. You got to hear some of what his project has been doing in terms of working with policymakers. Uh, and he mentioned uh, some of the science policy dialogue forums that have been started in West Africa. Those have been running for several years. In East Africa, they're called something a little bit different. They've been called learning alliances there, but it's essentially the same idea. Uh, the idea of these multi-stakeholder platforms that really bring to people together to break down those silos and get different ministries working together, different sectors working together, so that everybody can um, engage and learn from each other and help set priorities. And we use a special approach in um, some of our activities on scenarios. Each of the regions have created through a series of workshops with a broad array of stakeholders. They've created regional uh, future scenarios that then have been downscaled to at the, the national level and they've been used to inform a livestock plan in Ghana, in Burkina Faso, a poverty reduction strategy plan, um, in Cambodia for, I know it's in Bangladesh for a seven year, um, seven year development plan. So they're used in, in many different ways uh, to help inform policy. And so, and what we also try to do with these multi-stakeholder platforms, as other people have mentioned this morning, is, is link the scales between subnational and national. Uh, and I think even one of the West Africa platforms that was created is a member of GAXA. So that linkage from then national to, to global is also there. And so the work that I'm talking about today fits into the EEAG framework because, um, first of all, CCAFS is a research organization and so the work we do is embedded uh, in, in that. And the multi-stakeholder platforms that we've created bring together people from all of the different stakeholder groups uh, because we really want to create spaces for dialogue between all of those stakeholders. The on-the-ground research that we do is, we, we say sometimes it's options by context because we all know that CSA is not one particular thing. It's a different mix of practices and technologies that work um, within the different places and it's very context specific. And so we try to get that research into policy um, and not just government policy but also private sector policy, international organizations um, and other groups as well. So some of the challenges that we've found are, first of all, the funding stability. I don't know, for those of you who are more involved with CGIAR and the other um, coordinated research programs that it runs, you might be aware that we've had funding problems over the past few years. Every year, it seems like uh, we're told, okay, make some budget cuts and reduce your work. And that really has an effect on the partnerships that we've been building when all of a sudden you can't hold the workshops or you can't sponsor people to events um, that you said you were going to do. 
So that was a major, major hurdle uh, that many of the interviewees mentioned. And also uh, finding the time to get the decision makers you want to work with into your meetings and also going to attend their meetings. Uh, and we all know policymakers have competing priorities. They might not be as worried about um, climate change and agriculture as we all are. There was also a, an issue with staff turnover within ministries. Um, if you start to work with a certain person uh, and build their capacity, really educate them, get them interested in the work that you are producing, and then they're transferred somewhere else, it's a major setback and you have to start almost all over again. Evan mentioned this challenge. I'm very glad he, he brought this up because it validates uh, other information from the interviews. And the timing constraints of policymakers, of po setting policy, the researchers uh, want to take five years to produce a good output. The researchers or the policymakers want answers in a month or two. And so we have to figure out ways to make those time scales meet up better. Uh, and then also the work that we're doing is a specific skill set. Engaging with policymakers is something that not many scientists are trained for. <laughs> and so finding out what those uh, skills are, the skills of bringing together people from different ministries, from different research backgrounds, and having them all speak the same language um, really re requires a lot of facilitation skill. And, uh, and then sometimes uh, there's an issue of lack of capacity among policy partners, uh, and that requires a lot of um, training and, and education, and just uh, starting from where people are and bringing them up to, up to speed. So some of the lessons that we've learned, the, the enabling factors, have been sustained engagement, getting involved with your stakeholders right from the beginning, involving them in setting the research agenda, in co-production of knowledge, and really having their ownership and buy-in in what is being produced, and really creating personal relationships with those people that you're working with. Um, the, one of the major lessons, especially from the West Africa Science Policy Dialogue Forums, have been uh, having good institutional arrangements for the multi-stakeholder platforms that are created. And so the ones in West Africa are actually chaired by local organizations. They have their own uh, set of guidelines and hopefully they will continue to exist even after CCAFs as a program is finished. And they provide the, a space for dialogue and mutual learning and bringing together um, people from different ministries who might otherwise never meet or never work together. And this is another thing I think uh, that was talked about this morning is producing these demand-driven products and finding out what kind of research, what kind of um, data is needed and then working to, to help produce that. One of the other things that has been really key since policymaking is a, a very lengthy process, um, you have to be opportunistic. So instead of coming in and feeling like CCAFS wants to set the agenda on what needs to be uh, worked on or what the priority should be, we join ongoing processes. And if a national government is already working on revising a certain policy, then that's what we go and we try to, to help inform. And then, since it is lengthy, it needs patience and it needs perseverance. Um, the results are not always as quick as we want, and so it, it requires a lot of patience. And then being inclusive, um, I think, is one of the other major lessons. And so it's being mindful of who's in the room and who's not in the room, and that you know we can take consideration of things like gender, youth, wealth, power, and influence, do we have the private sector there? Do we have civil society there? And do we have good representation? So thank you very much. So thank you very much, Laura and Mark. And good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Germana, and I am uh, a consultant supporting GAXA and the research unit here in FAO. 
So I will uh, close the presentation with a more country-driven one. Uh, so I will present the Italian case study on Italian synergies and innovation for scaling up CSA. Uh, the case study is a clear example of collaboration at different levels and proves that it's possible to overcome disparity and foreseen common goals throughout multi-level policies and enabling environment and engagement and cooperation. Uh, the case studies in particular promotes an enabling policy environment to achieve both national and local CSA throughout cooperation and knowledge sharing. And in particular, it focuses uh, on conservation agriculture, no tillage practices, climate smart production system, and knowledge transfer that in Italy are called together the Italian blue agriculture. Uh, there are five leading entities involved in the case study and each of them developed a proper strategy through the implementation of projects supported by national and European policies. Uh, we have two main institutions, the Italian Ministry of Agricultural Food and Forestry Policies and the Italian Ministry of the Environment and Protection of Land and Seas. And then we have one region, which is the Emilia-Romagna region, and two research institutions, the Institute of Biometeorology of the National Research Council of Italy and the Council of Agricultural Research and Economics. I will now quickly present to you some socio-economic environmental characteristics of Italy and the major national and European economic instruments. Uh, so Italy is uh, a Mediterranean country and it has multiple pedoclimate with uh, different and similar territories uh, with differences between north and the south. But Italy is the one of the richest countries in Europe for biodiversity intensity. Uh, concerning the agricultural sector, it has an added value to the economy of 3.3% and uh, with a production estimated of uh, around 54,000 billion euro. And recently, Italy has experimented um, a soil loss of 2.4%, but what is interesting is that the farm trend demonstrated an increase in the average size of the farms. And also in Italy, we have a lot of multifunctional farms uh, that uh, produce renewable energy and convert their products. And also, Italy has uh, experimented an increase in certified organic production of around 7.7%, and also a decrease in pesticides, uh, the, thanks to climate smart practices. Uh, the livestock sector is in decline for pigs and cattle, but is steady on for poultry and sheep. Um, the major policy and financial instruments contributed to climate change mitigation uh, arose mainly from uh, the Common Agricultural Policy and the European Agricultural Fund for Rural Development, which is the second pillar of the CAP, that in Italy is implemented by 21 regional rural development programs. Then also in Italy, we have the National Rural Development Network Program and the Strategic Plan for Innovation and Research in Agriculture, Food and Forestry that promotes the transfer of knowledge and innovation in agriculture and forestry in rural areas. And also Italy has its proper uh, climate change strategy. Um, the case study uh, focused mainly on the local dimension and attention is given to local farmers and local producers, um, supporting them with policies in the transition. And so local producers, the private sector and end users are mutually connected throughout common policies and projects. And also participation and knowledge sharing is developed through a lot of platforms, such as the one developed by IBIMET, and um, online applications such as the IRINET for water management for small-scale farmers, and various, various forums of participation and stakeholder engagement. And Italy is, uh, is also pursuing some international collaboration, and in particular, the Ministry IMOS um, undertakes action for international capacity building in Botswana, Ecuador, and Ethiopia. And what is important that it, all these policies are supported by the research community with analysis and data collection for testing the effectiveness and durability of such policies. And in particular, CREA has developed the Gaia software 
uh, which analyzes the farm system through the use of specific indicator. And within the VIVA project of EMELS, uh, four types of indicator are used at the farm level to assess uh, the sustainability of the wine production system in Italy. Um, so some of the major results and achievement can be summarized with an um, increase in the labor intensity of 75% and uh, an increase in net soil productivity of 14% according to, uh, um, to other agricultural practice and a good assessment of water flow and sustainable winery management and also a significant redux reduction in CO2 emissions from the agro-food system uh, of around 40%. And the private sector also is involved in such policies and uh, it supports the farmer with the private investment throughout the multi-regional guarantee platform and the Industria 4.0 plan. Um, what are the key elements for enabling environment? So, for sure, a great engagement with potential users earlier in the innovation process, because it's very important to ensure the sharing of information. Um, policymakers have a role to play in climate smart agro technological innovation. Uh, policies need to be compatible with CSI object, uh, objectives and their ability, uh, it's important to boost the development and adoption of CSI technologies and innovations. Um, appropriate education programs and awareness raising campaign would be better prepare technology providers to address the market needs and customers um, for the adoption of climate smart policies and technologies. And also the identification of knowledge need for CSA throughout consultative uh, and participatory approaches. Um, the case study showcases a lot of results and best practices, but still there are some challenges to overcome. Uh, for example, uh, the heterogeneity of governance and projects lead often to a lack of cohesion among divers and actors. So um, a good support is needed uh, and also to secure the know-how to avoid short circuits in the adoption of bad practices pathways. Uh, in fact, what is particular in Italy is that often there is abundance of innovation and funds and expertise, but the adoption is not always pursued because of mistrust of local entities, so it's really important to create trust among all the actors. And the limited financial support often leads to a deficiency in finalizing projects and activities, so it's better to, um, to have a correct mapping of financial instrument and possibility that will guarantee a high success. Uh, also, there's a consistent lack of data, so that it, this needs to be fulfilled for monitoring and assessment. And a better balance for cost and benefits of technology adoption throughout the supply chain should be estimated. And also capacity building and fair access to funds should be guaranteed through ad hoc instrument and uh, information sharing, consultation, uh, also um, with the research institution is really essential and also um, a validation of a risk management index could be really relevant in assessing economic risk and benefits and preventing from criticism and support of uh, cooperative activities so in alliance with technical expertise will be uh, important to ensure ownership and uh, enhancing uh, knowledge um, so, um, the case study uh, has been conceived as a living document and will be continuously updated with new best practices and um, projects for evidence based on climate smart agriculture. Thank you for all the clear case study team. <laughs> Thanks to the panelists. We'd like to open it up for some input from the audience. And these are meant to be suggestive questions for you to consider your thoughts on and um, ideas, inputs, questions for the panel. 
So the floor is open. And I, I think what we'll do is we'll take three, assuming we have some questions, we'll take three or four and then allow the panelists to uh, consider them. And we, we want this to, once again, the theme here is, um, is to glean and get input and have dialogue. So we're here in the remaining time we have to uh, ask for you to reflect upon and, and give us some of your thoughts or questions or observations, and we're happy to respond. And I, I guess each, there's a microphone at each uh, desk, so I, I think we have a question here. And uh, by the way, please identify yourself, and, and we'll take a few questions and then get back. So I think there's one over there. Thank you, Is Roberto Sofefa from uh, Costa Rica, the Ministry of Agriculture and Livestock uh, Extension Service. Uh, thank you for uh, the beautiful presentations. Uh, in fact, uh, one of the, of the biggest challenges we have is how to, how to, to maintain uh, alive the, the, the participation of local farmers. Uh, I would like to know uh, in, the, in, the, in the experience uh, it was uh, presented, uh, the ideas about how to get alive, how to, to maintain alive the participation of, of uh, local consumers, uh, sorry, local producers in terms of uh, climate smart agriculture. And um, the, other, the other important issue I would mention uh, is uh, the, the data on uh, how the new technology, the climate smart uh, technologies function in the system, the cost benefit. Because yeah, most of the time we don't we don't have uh, data in order to uh, motivate other farmers to uh, scale up the, the the technologies. So, what are your ideas uh, about how to get this this uh, data? Thank you so much. Okay, thanks, Roberto. So we have two questions. One on, and I think they're important, quite relevant, uh, maintaining participation of farmers at the local level, and the second one is about. Uh, the new, two ne new technologies, how do they function and how do we get that data and how do we, I, I suppose, uh, get that communicated to, at the local level? Those are two good questions. Uh, we've got someone here. Please identify yourself. Tony Shantanis with the World Business Council on Sustainable Development. Um, this question was uh, specifically for Laura, but maybe for the rest of the panel as well. Um, we have a, an ongoing partnership with CCAFs. Um, I was just interested from your perspective on some of uh, your views on engaging with the private sector. You mentioned that. Um, what are the, some of the challenges you've had around that? And from the enabling perspective, uh, what do you think are the tools and methods you could use to, to tackle it? Tony, so that's, that's a question that is certainly worth getting some uh, response in terms of that dialogue and interaction with private sector in the enabling environment context. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I wanted to find Please out- Please identify uh, yourself. My name is Justice. I'm from Zimbabwe Climate Change Coalition. Uh, I thought maybe all the presenters were also going to really touch on the issue of labor saving technologies in land preparations, irrigation, and post harvest tending. So I, I, I actually I didn't hear that because this is most actually prob problematic issues that we are facing, especially in Africa with regards to small scaleholder farmers. Also, if you had to look at the youth, you know, they are overburdened. So what we need is, do we have any solutions with regard to smart technologies that we can even use in our respective areas? Thank you. Thank you, Justice. So you're asking about labor, small farmers, youth, and the climate smart mechanisms to, to engage. Thank you. Uh, take one more question, try to get some answers, and then We'll go through another round, and we do have some time, so this is good to get some back and forth dialogue. So, um, let's see, who, who do we have? Uh, right there, please. So, my name is Mike Gerbich. I'm professor of developmental genetics and genomics, working on genome of pests and invasive species. And actually, what I've seen here is really very broad and interesting discussion, and the question is how we can include new technologies to mitigate problems of global warming. 
And this is something that we as human species, first time in our history, have our user manual. We have our genome sequence, which tells us about risk factors, strengths, capabilities to actually combat and uh, face different conditions. So, actually genome sequencing in different crops, animals, invasive pests, and etc., is something which would really serve as new technology breakthrough because, for example, in the fertilizer field, if we have these plants which are going to produce their own fertilizers, which Bayer is trying to do right now, we can have kind of really big technological jumps because, to be honest, using conventional technology, I cannot see how we can increase agricultural production 50 percent by 2050. And this is something that it is not science fiction anymore. Our genome sequencing machine, which is currently used, costs 800 euros, and you can get your genome sequence in the afternoon. And this is technology which is coming very rapidly, and I think we should be very aware of all these things which are going to dramatically change technology or how we can actually combat uh, global warming. Thank you. Is that Mike? Is that um, the importance of um, new technologies, including genomes? Uh, by the way, when we um, have all these brilliant answers, it might be good to refer to where these questions and issues raised fit in the framework. Because part of what I think we want to do here is to acknowledge that there are some gaps in what we've addressed and not addressed, and that could spur us on to new areas to, to focus on in 2018 and beyond. So as the panel thinks about response to these questions, think of where they fit in the framework. And um, let's, let's stop here and get some feedback from the panel. So, I have one, two, three, four, five questions. Uh, the first one is um, maintaining participation at local farmer level re relative to CSA. We haven't rehearsed this, so who would like to take the first one on that in the panel? So thank you for that, uh, for the question. Uh, and. Um, the participation of local farmers is, like I said, uh, it need, there, there needs to be a, a clear interest in, uh, uh, for them to, uh, to, to, um, to keep engaged. And I think that uh, the information sharing part is very important. Uh, 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 it could be uh, access to, to technologies, to, uh, um, to linking them to, to, to the support services, uh, like also finance and uh, um, um, inputs, uh, markets, uh, that, uh, that can, can be important for them. The next question is um, new technology functions and benefits. Um, Germana, are you going to address that? Um, yes. Uh, uh, so it's a very interesting question. Um, as you know, uh, collecting data uh, with um, especially on new technologies, new best practices, and uh, also assessing the cost-benefit of such practices, uh, it's a long process because you have to collect ex ante and ex post data. Uh, so a lot of projects within our case study are still collecting data, which are great le literature right now, but uh, this data will be really useful for frame policies. and. Uh, they will be available throughout participation platforms, throughout information sharing. So uh, I think that uh, there's still time to, to, to collect and proceed data, but we are uh, on this process right now. So I hope that I answered your question. Also, Germano, in terms of answering that question, where do you see that fitting in the matrix of the framework? Uh, well, um, for sure in capacity, 
capacity, uh, so our collaboration with research organization and also the, at the local level because uh, you actually you collate data on the field sometimes. So I will, yeah, will fit in the capacity. Also, as we uh, reflect upon the questions and input, if they don't seem to fit into the framework, let's consider improving and refining the framework. So that's why I think it's good to ask where it fits or doesn't fit. I, I think the next question was directed to Laura. Thanks, thanks for your question. Um, CCAPS is engaged with the, the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. It's not um, something I'm directly involved with, so, uh, but I'd love to, to talk to you more about it. Um, in terms of challenges of dealing with the private sector, I think there's sometimes some hesitancy from maybe researchers, scientists to engage with private sector, you know, the big corporations, they might think, well, there's a hidden agenda behind what they want to do. Um, but I think you have to look at what are the common goals and I think there are some commonalities there and I've been hearing I you know have traveled to a few of these conferences over the past couple of years and I continually hear we need to engage with the private sector and we have to do it um, and and yet we still don't see many private sector people in the room um, so I think it's something that we do need to come to grips with and figure out how to do uh, so this um, work that I've presented today was mostly on engaging with national um, governments but I think we can also do some work around you know what are those challenges and how do we overcome them um, and the one last thing I would want to say is that we also need to consider all sizes of the private sector and the farmers that we work with as small scale as they are they all sell some of their produce and so we have to also think of them as the private sector thank you Wilson. so i wanted to maybe give some thoughts in terms of the enabling environment for many of the questions that were asked i would turn it back around to ask you to answer the question by thinking about, you know, you talked about how do we, um, how do we engage farmers and how do we keep them motivated and involved. So an, an idea is really going back to farmers and using social science research to talk to them to understand what are the barriers to adoption of CSA, what are their needs and what mechanisms exist. Um, and if you think about that in terms of the enabling environment, is there support for that? Are there uh, adequately trained extension specialists? Um, are there, if farmers need tools, are there data and uh, tools that can be developed? Um, Divine, you asked about how do we get data to small scale, smallholder farmers and get youth engaged in smart technology. Again, I, I would ask the countries you're working with, what's, what are the policy barriers to making that happen? It's, it's kind of being a sleuth in identifying um, what are the barriers to this, to this work and then identifying what needs to change and then communicating that effectively with different agencies or organizations. I think we're on to the last question which was looking at some of the new cutting edge technologies and how can they be uh, utilized to help address mitigation as I think at least part of the question who would like to address that I would ask you the same question what are the barriers that are inhibiting uh, adoption of those technologies is it lack of funding for research or lack of um, scientists sometimes don't communicate their science to consumers or to organizations so um, think of those policy barriers and how they could be overcome to make sure that we are using the most latest research Actually, I'm glad that the uh, answer to my question was in period, period of silence, which <laughs> actually just shows how little of this scientific revolution which is happening right now is trickling down. And we need much, much more education 
and uh, actually knowledge distribution to uh, actually other parts of community because especially uh, looking at these specialized crops, traditional crops, which are, for example, grown in uh, African countries which have specific uh, genetics uh, adapted to local climate and etc. And by uh, understanding, as I'm repeating again, our user manual, because uh, in our DNA code, we have our risk factors and etc. And to me, it was amazing to actually sequence my own genome and to actually find that I have 2% of uh, genes from sub-Saharan Africa, that I have some percentage of English genes, South European genes uh, and etc. And uh, many plants, actually grown in local environment may give us knowledge how to combat global warming, drought, how they respond to pests and etc. So this is not really technology which is actually focused only in developed countries. What we need is this biological diversity where you have native plants which are able to adapt to environment where we can use this knowledge of DNA for marker assisted breeding in some cases we may have to resort to transgenic plants and etc. And speaking of which, we are also transgenic. I have 3% of Neanderthal genome uh, in my DNA. And uh, if, I, if, I, if I might interject, I think we've really come up upon an important issue here. And I appreciate that silence sometimes is quite relevant. You've identified an area that needs further examination and could arguably be a way forward for us to undertake to collectively and collaborate within the alliance. So the fact that there's silence is not a bad thing. And I speak to not only you, but to others. To me, when we get together uh, on Thursday, we would look for engaging in new areas to focus on. This is a good case in point. So the fact that we don't have the answer means there's a gap in this analysis, and I would like to see you on Thursday coming forward to join in the endeavor and become a participant, whether it's in the enabling and or the knowledge or both. So point well taken, and the fact that we didn't have an answer means here's an area to pursue and to put into our program of work. So let's continue on with more questions, but thank you for finding something we didn't have the answer to, it, it shows what we need to do on Thursday. Bernard, please identify yourself. So this is um, Bernard with uh, Yara International. <clears throat> Uh, when we have uh, previously uh, discussed smallholder development, uh, we have often talked about uh, an enabling environment in terms of both um, soft and hard infrastructure. So soft in infrastructure typically being uh, um, transparency on pricing, uh, education for farmers, uh, extension services, uh, loans, uh, insurance, etc. But then you also have the hard infrastructure that's also needed uh, uh, if the farmers are to build the scale and productivity that's needed to become competitive. So that's uh, roads, rail, storage, drying capacity, etc. So I don't, I don't see that much currently in this framework about the hard infrastructure, but a lot about the soft. So is there any comment on or thoughts on the hard infrastructure elements? So that, that's a question we'll uh, take on board is um, the recognition that there may be areas in the framework that doesn't get to all aspects of infrastructure. Thank you. Other questions? Over there, please. Okay. My name is Jan Hels and I uh, work for the SPC, Pacific Community, as the Director, Land Resources Division. Uh, I have, well, Working for SITS has its own uh, peculiar uh, conditions, and uh, this we are working. We are trying to work on uh, establishing a climate smart agricultural program. So there are issues of uh, of scale, issues of capacity, very poor capacity, and changing capacity, and also absorption capacity. 
This, and I think also this is the fact that sometimes we think as, uh, with all my respect, of course, as scientists and researchers, we are a, 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 an organization, research for purpose organization, but we sometimes forget what uh, the real needs of the, of the member countries are in a, in a particular re uh, region. So this is one, so this is those issues within, uh, within the Pacific region, huh? this dealing with, uh, with SIDS. The second one is uh, just to contribute to the discussion on, on genetics. We have have a so-called center for, center for Pacific Crops and Trees, and we entered into a memorandum of understanding with IAEA just to develop further gene genetic sequencing, molecular marker breeding, to speed up some of the, the issues, uh, adaptation, uh, just to improve adaptation to climate change. This is going to take uh, a bit of time, of course, but uh, it is good that we have this partnership established. Thank you. So you were... Um raising a particular important issue relative to SIDS on uh, scaling up in capacity. And I, I think that's an area we probably haven't addressed sufficiently. And that could lend itself, once again, to, to identifying new work to, to collaborate on that within the alliance. And then you also made uh, a reference to genetics relative to adaptation. Thank you. Other questions? Thank you, Mark, and I'm going to ask a question. Double hat, Canada, as well as GAXA co-chair. Um, I mean, there were a few references to the importance of gender, uh, but I wonder, and, and that's, that's a case where we can see what's the linkage between the knowledge and the policy. I mean, in the knowledge we did, GAXA had done a practice brief on gender responsive approach, and we all know that if we need to transform our food, uh, food systems to make them climate smarter, we need to have gender transformative approaches even more. So how has that translated into policies that you can leverage uh, women as innovators and, and, and how that, knowing that they're um, half of the farmers in many developing countries, uh, and how has that affected as well adoption of CSA practices? And maybe just to point out that I think that there had been a proposal in the past that it would be under this environment, uh, enabling environment group, that there could be a subgroup looking more at how to mainstream gender and as well uh, engage more systematically youth. Thanks. Thank you, Mi. So you're, you're raising the issue of um, highlighting the need to reference gender, and maybe there's a nexus there with knowledge and policy and part of your question is, uh, what have we done in that regard? Okay, so I have four questions. Either one or uh, there, please. Hello, so my name is Javier Fernandez Castañon. I'm a PhD student in physics here at the University of La Sapienza. And I'm also the um, director and the founder of a um, charity that now counts with thousands of farmers in the southwest of Uganda. So um, combining that I'm doing uh, research with the labor I was doing uh, that I'm uh, currently doing in Uganda, I would like to, to go in the direction of, of um, research. And what to do, which is one of the main problems that we are facing in Uganda right now, what to do when um, the scientific research about carbon emissions, about um, deforestation, and how they are related with, um, with climate change and global warming are being directly ignored, or what is the best, um, probably the best question, what is the best way to make pressure on the institutions, the power institutions, to invert this, um, this, this behavior? Thank you. Sorry, I, I had a little trouble hearing your question. Maybe speak a little bit more into the mic. You're talking about research, but I think in a particular way, if you wouldn't mind repeating it. Yeah, now? Yeah. Okay. So um, basically the question was, should I start from the beginning? No, just, just still it. <laughs> okay. So basically the question is what to do when um, um, the scientific research that has been done about um, carbon emission and deforestation, especially in a country like um, Uganda, is being directly ignored by the institutions. and what is the best way to make pressure from, for example, from our position that we, are, we, we can with thousand farmers, but the small holders that um, um, possess very small lands, and 
so we, are in a, we have not a strong position in, in Uganda, but what is the best way that we could, um, and how we could invert this, this behavior from the institutions? Uh, let's pause now. We have five questions. Uh, I'll ask the panel. The first one had to do with smallholder enabling environment. Uh, the difference between looking at that from a soft and hard infrastructure perspective. Um, I think it, it, it is in, uh, in the framework um, if you're looking at uh, uh, governments and the capacity, so infrastructure dedicated to uh, climate smart agriculture. Uh, I could also refer to, to that hard infrastructure. Um, and it's in, in a way echoing a bit the, 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 my colleagues that ownership uh, at, at the, those different levels is, is is key to make things work for uh, uh, for climate smart agriculture, and the same goes for for that hard infrastructure where uh, it's really key to get input from the smallholder farmers in the, in, in planning and implementing uh, uh, that those investments in hard infrastructure. So we all know the stories about storage capacity that um, that's in the wrong place or uh, uh, roads that um, uh, yeah, lead, lead to nowhere, literally and, and figuratively. But maybe my colleagues want to compliment me. Um, I think, yeah, um, I think a couple of the issues uh, that we've heard about from the questions, you know, some of it can be done with, you know, more economic analyses by showing policymakers, you know, if you improve your roads, you're going to uh, increase your export earnings or something like that, and you know, maybe that can be convincing, maybe it's not convincing enough, you know, for if the people the, in Uganda are not even listening to what's coming out, then how do you deal with that? Um, and so sometimes the, the idea of evidence-based policy making works and other times it doesn't uh, because there are competing interests at Pele, there's, you know, different sorts of, of power um, issues. And so, you know, I think from the research side of things, we can generate in information on the cost benefit ana analyses and things like that. Um, and so in some cases that, that can work, uh, but in other cases, um, what we've done with CCAF, sometimes we've taken policymakers uh, on learning journeys, we've called them, and taken them out to see some of the smallholder farms, um, to meet the people who are doing uh, the different kinds of trials and practices. And um, it's difficult because I think, I, I live in Kenya and policymakers stay in Nairobi and they seem to only think about um, what's happening in Nairobi and the, the outer places um, kind of get ignored sometimes. And so trying to open up people's minds and expose them to different things um, can maybe sometimes help. And if I can talk a little bit about the gender also so that I <laughs> finish up a little bit. Um, with that, you know, I think those sorts of exposure can also work. We had an issue in Tanzania where um, one of our projects was doing a, a presentation about gender and climate change and actually the male policymakers in the room kind of didn't even believe that climate change was affecting women differently than men and it was the female policymakers who had to kind of educate them on no actually this is different for different groups and so sometimes we come from a side of things where we just assume that they will know what the issues are and you have to kind of start from basics. And so understanding the audience, I think is really important. Um, so some of those uh, ways that we've been working on gender is collecting different um, disaggregated data when we trial different practices and technologies, look at, looking at whether they're labor saving or labor increasing um, and trying to then use that information to inform policymakers. Thank you, Laura. I, I think in part you also address, since you come from a research organization, the fifth question about um, the idea that there's research out there if, and if it's being ignored, that's, you sort of answered that a little bit by saying, well, what did you call that when you, my Learning journeys, right. yeah. Right. I, I think also that we, it, it's okay that we don't have the full answers because this is meant to be 
suggestive of new things to engage upon. Um, so we're mindful of this and we want to revisit it later in the week. These are good thoughts and good areas that we can refine this draft document and add to it and make it better. Another thing that strikes me is uh, one of the challenges of this framework is that it has in the left-hand column all these different stakeholders, but how do we deal with the interaction between them? That's something we may want to look at. Uh, another question that came up was on SIDS and the need to scale up in capacity. Who would like to address that? I think it's similar also to the genetics, is that's an area where we need to pursue further and it's most welcome, it's, it's, it's awfully important and being involved with the UN the climate negotiations, we understand that. So I would ask you to engage and bring this up on Thursday because it's an area, frankly, we haven't addressed. So I, I, I can appreciate why the panel isn't able to address that, but we're not going to forget that unless someone on the panel wants to address it. I don't see any volunteers. Um, I, I'd like to say one more thing about the uh, gender issue that me has raised. Uh, initially last year, no, the beginning of this year, we were going to embark upon a separate um, case study or analysis on gender because it's very important. And we had some parties that were interested in doing it, but it didn't materialize. So I think that's something that needs to be done. And my own sense is I would recommend that we consider this as something for work for 2018. And Laura touched on it a little bit, the importance and relevance in Mies' question. So that's an area where I think we have a gap. In fact, if you look at this uh, chart, look on the back page. Part of what this shows is where there are gaps, and they're already emerging here as you come forward with some of your ideas. So it's not only what we have, but what we don't have that could speak to what we need to uh, address amongst ourselves for work going forward next year. Um, th there was the question on genetics, but I think we've already touched on that a little bit, and I, I suggest we revisit that on Thursday. Are, are we about out of time now, I think? Yeah. Okay, well, uh, uh, this was very good to get and forth amongst all of you, and I, I sense that there's a lot more interest and ideas. Let's speak in the hallways. Let's speak when we break out into to groups tomorrow. And pick, particularly when we come together with each of the action groups to take some of the thoughts that you're uh, referencing here and put them forward for work for us to address in a concrete way. That's really what this is all about. And I want to thank the panelists for, and of course the audience, for beginning to engage in what we're trying to do here over the next three days. So at this point, uh, I believe where we are is we go to lunch, is that right, on the eighth floor? And do you, do you want to announce something, please? So thanks very much. So the lunch is at eighth floor in the blue bar and the restaurant. Bianca and Julian uh, will guide you to the to the restaurant. And uh, we, I think, we are a little bit late. So if you can stay here uh, around the two o'clock, uh, maintaining the same uh, uh, schedule uh, is good. Thank you very much.